Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second of the DHET webinars in relation to projects that we have undertaken to support um, universities to offer good quality teaching and learning through a range of projects that have been supported by the European Union. Today's webinar is entitled A Dialogue, Contributing to, to Lecturer Professionalization in Adult and Community Education and Training. And if you've had a look at the program, today's program mainly addresses the research, the programs, and the student experiences in the adult and community education training component of what we call the College Lecturer Education Project. This was very generously supported um, and funded by the European Union through what we call a budget sector support grant. And the project is part of the larger teaching and learning development capacity improvement program, which started in 2015 in partnership with the European Union, with the aim of supporting universities to develop capacity to offer relevant and quality programs that are responsive to South Africa's priority needs in the preschooling, the schooling and the post-schooling sectors. Holding such a dialogue, colleagues, um, might seem a little bit like blowing the department's own vuvuzela in terms of the amazing work that has been done by the committed ac academics on our projects, academics who work tirelessly outside of the normal academic workloads uh, to ensure the success of this particular project. But um, I think that you will agree with me when I say that the successful external evalu evaluation of a project is not in itself a measure of success. And we have already received a successful midterm evaluation. We are now awaiting the summit of one, which will happen later this year. But this external, this the successful midterm evaluation in itself is not a measure of our success, particularly when we're working in a space which is intertwined with unequal education, with poverty, with unemployment, and also characterized by inadequate resources which still bedevil our country. It is also not only a success when we acclaim the number of CHE accredited programs to professionalize lecturers in the colleges, which is one of the main deliverables of the universities in this project. The impact of the learning and teaching must be evident. That is that we need to see through results and me measurements that we have quality lecturers in the ASET who offer quality teaching and learning that shows knowledge and application of appropriate pedagogies in adult and community education and programs that are not just simply a rehash of the old adult basic education programs. If we cannot show this evidence, then I believe that once again, our policies will be critiqued as idealistic, as not realistic. The policy to professionalize lecturers will be given the same critique. And I would like to steal something from, from Professor Valley when, uh, Valley when he speaks about um, policies. He says the policies can be described as a jewelry box of policies. And I really love that metaphor because it shows how our policies might be ideal and beautiful to behold, but they have no real practical value. And so we hope that this dialogue will open up critical debate on the efficacy of the DHET's attempts through this project to professionalize the sector. And through what might be an uncomfortable space for us will still allow us to reflect on how we can truly show the success of the goals of this project. So once again, welcome to the dialogue and please do participate in the chats with questions and comments. Colleagues, it is now my pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker who will be uh, presenting the opening address. Dr. Ray is the Head of Cooperation of the Delegation of the European Commission to South Africa. And as I said earlier on, um, we are very excited and pleased that he found time in his very busy schedule to be able to um, pre present the opening address to us at this dialogue. 
Thank you, Dr. Ray. Over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, representatives of the departments of higher education and training, professors, academics, representatives of universities, schools, think tanks, civil society organizations, community education and training college, colleagues, friends. It's a, it's a very large audience today, and I'm very happy to say a few words at this uh, webinar focusing on adult and community education and training in South Africa. Education features prominently in the EU development cooperation strategy with South Africa. And we are extremely pleased to have been collaborating for so many years with the Department of Higher Education and Training, the universities, the education institutions, as well as the civil society organizations that work in advancing the education agenda in the country. Education is multifaceted, as you know. It touches all sectors of the society. Often, we tend to focus more on the education of children and young people. And although this is a naturally a critical aspect, it should not be on our only focus. Adult education is a vitally important, albeit sometimes neglected, area. And I'll try to give some headlines on what we try to do in Europe as well, because if you believe that South Africa is the only country grappling with the challenge of adult education, I can tell you that the answer is no. We see this reflected, for instance, at the level of the Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda 2030. Two indicators, at least, speak to adult education. 4.4, increase the number of people who have relevant skills. 4.6, ensure that all youth and adults have numeracy and literacy. Indicator 4.C, sustainably increase the supply of qualified teachers is also vitally important. And the latter aspect, this latter aspect, is really what is being discussed today. You may ask, why should we use resources on adult education when early childhood development, basic education, tertiary education, experience, major challenges. Adult education is, in our view, critical for a range of reasons, and I will try to list a few. First, it can strengthen and regenerate civil society. This makes a significant contribution to active citizenship, democracy, and participation. Adult education contributes to critical thinking. It empowers individuals and ultimately the communities they are living in. It enables agency and facilitates transparency. Secondly, adult education can compensate the lack of education in earlier life and enable social mobility. Thus, it promotes social cohesion, equity and equality. Outreach to groups that are not participating in learning is necessary in order to achieve more social cohesion. And that's very important. Thirdly, adult education is key when it comes to improving employment prospects and prepare citizens to the digital world and the new jobs, the jobs of the future in a more general world. The positive link between employment and learning is obvious. The fourth industrial revolution, the digi digital world, present new challenges, but also new opportunities. E-government, access to information, and the rapid rate of change necessitate the closing of the digital gap and make sure that everyone is comfortable using computers, tablets, smartphones, 
and other related tools. We can also assume that many jobs that we know today are and will be disappearing while new ones will be created. This requires new skills and crucially the constant upgrading of skills or lifelong learning, not only for young people, but also for adult learners. To be even more clear, many of the jobs our children will have to do will have to not even exist today. Many jobs that adults hold today will also disappear before those adults retire. There is an urgent need for lifelong adult education to continuously adapt to the changing world of the work. Fourthly, participation in adult education can improve the quality of life and teach new life skills that generate health and well-being. Adult education can provide a number of ways that will support individuals throughout their careers. It also transforms lives, provides new opportunities. It can offer new job opportunities, open the pathway to formal learning, help school dropouts, return to education, help parents in their tasks, activate people's artistic and cultural passions and lead to healthier lifestyles. Fifthly, it is a driver for the interconnections of the three dimensions of the Sustainable Development Agenda, the economic, the social and the environmental. There is a real need for education for sustainable development and especially non-formal education has a very high impact to the Agenda 2030. So having touched on these five points on for on highlighting uh, the importance of adult education, I want to assure you that in Europe it's also a priority. And what is the EU doing today uh, to support adult learning? About 20, 10 years ago, in 2011, the European Union, the Council, which are all the member states of the European Union, adopted a resolution on the renewed European agenda for adult learning. It highlights the need to significantly increase adult participation in formal, non-formal and informal learning whether to acquire work skills for active citizenship or for personal development and fulfillment. And this agenda outlines a vision of how adult learning should develop in Europe and set various priorities. Increase the supply and demand for high quality provision especially in literacy, numeracy, and digital skills. Ensure effective outreach, guidance, and motivation strategies to reach and assist adult learners. Offer more flexible opportunities for adults to learn. Improve access through more learning at the workplace. The use of ICTs and so-called second chance qualification programs. Enhance the quality of adult learning by monitoring the impact of policies and improving, and that's very important, the training provided to adult educators. And this later aspect resonates very strongly with what we are discussing today. Further to this agenda, the Council of the European Union adopted a recommendation on upskilling pathways aiming to help adults acquire a minimum level of literacy, numeracy, digital skills, or a specific upper secondary level qualification. A working group on adult learning with national experts representative of social partners, civil society members was established and 
uh, it was uh, an electronic platform for adult learning in Europe was created. It was called Epale. And the platform provides a multilingual, important in Europe, online space to exchange, showcase, promote best practices in adult education, as well as to promote peer learning across countries. A network of national coordinators was to promote adult learning in their countries, provide policy advice, and support, gather, disseminate best practices has also been established. Coming back to South Africa uh, and the community education and training in South Africa and how the EU has been assisting, we have provided dedicated support to the community training and education sector through the TLD program in addition to the support to universities to develop new, new qualifications. In 2018, we provided technical assistance to the Department of Higher Education and Training to develop training materials on methods, tools, approaches in management and governance of CET colleges. We facilitated numerous capacity building and training workshops for uh, set college management, the principals, the deputy principals, their governing councils, and the student representative council members. In 2019, we funded the study tour to India for DHET officials and set colleges principals. And the purpose of the study tour was to benchmark South Africa set college practices with those in India in order to develop set college principles capacity to best manage community colleges and exposing them to relevant international standards. In terms of conclusion, we cannot talk about improving and expanding adult education without examining the professionalization of the lecturers who deliver the education. It is such a critical area. And the CLEP program has made a very valuable and contribution in this regard. Your deliberations today will further strengthen this critical aspect. The investment in human capital will have far-reaching positive returns. And if I look at the priorities of the European Union in the coming months, in the coming years, I see that human development and preparing the youth and the adults for the jobs of the future is critically important and features prominently in the wishes of Commissioner Jopilain and our Commissioner for Inter International Partnerships. And it's also ensuring that a human-centric digital development is taking place. Digitalization is changing our way of working and will change our way of working in the future. The EU wants to accompany countries in this progress, making sure that no one is left behind. And I want, in conclusion, to Thank you for your dedication, commitment, and wish you well for today's deliberation. I shall not be able to follow them fully, uh, but I know that my colleagues will uh, report to me after following the discussion on how you have gone. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray. Um, I found that your your opening address was very, very important to us. I want to mention a few things. I'm sure other colleagues would actually have noted others, but we appreciate the five points that you highlighted in your presentation as you started it, because I think that they resonate very well with our constitution in terms of our human rights. And that's something very important that we should bear in mind as South Africans in education and in other areas of our society. 
So thank you for actually um, showing us the links between what you have said and our human rights issue. The second thing that I wanted to say is that I appreciate the global view that you have given regarding adult education. And particularly um, important for me was a comment that you made around a, a global platform for, I think you called it, adult learning in Europe. And I think I would like to follow up with that, if you don't mind, at some point in the future um, to find out a little more about it and the possibilities of trying to get South Africa involved or trying to get something like that um, uh, set up in South Africa. Um, Dr. Ray, I also think it's, uh, while I appreciate the um, the, uh, the recognition of the CLEP project, um, I'm very excited about it, about professionalization being very important. I think you also mentioned that besides the formal qualifications, the informal and the non-formal are just as important. And that has been something that we've grappled with as we've gone through the five years of the project, because invariably, when Whenever we present on the project, um, there are voices of concern from the non-formal sector around what the department is doing and from the informal sector. And, and you will see, I think it's Professor Kruner from UWC who will be talking about access into the formal qualifications, barriers into the formal qualifications and what they have done in terms of that. And I'm very happy to also see, I'm sure there are more universities, but to also see that UCT is actually offering non-formal qualifications um, in, in community interest areas. And through that, allowing access of those students into higher education. So thank you once again, Dr. Ray. The work that we've achieved in the project would not have been possible without the financial and collegial support and insight from the European Union delegates in South Africa. Um, I also, Dr. Ray, would like at this point to also show appreciation to Dr. Josette Muller from the European Union. Dr. Muller sat through us on project steering committee meetings from the start and is still continuing with the, that. And I want to say, Josette, Thank you for keeping us on our toes in those PSC meetings. Um, one had to go into those meetings adequately prepared, as well as being able to respond to all the uh, queries that you raised. But you always offered advice and acknowledgement and motivation for us to see through the work in the last five years. So I want to say ngyabonga gakulu and thank you very much. Colleagues, we now move on to the keynote speaker, and I'm sure we all know Professor Salim Vali very, very well. Um, Prof. Vali, we're very pleased and honored that you agreed to present the keynote speech today, despite your very busy schedule. I know earlier on you indicated that um, I kept you awake last night trying to get this work done. Um, I also know, Prof you dislike lengthy introductions and that you would prefer me to introduce you with the minimum of information. But I believe that your reputation precedes you. Most of us at the dialogue know that you are professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Joburg, Johannesburg, where you also hold the position of Director of the Centre for Education, Rights and Transformation. We all also know that you hold the NRF Sachi Chair in Community Adult and Work Education, and that you are a visiting prof at MNU. We also know that you are a prolific writer. Um, I, I won't go into the details of the numbers uh, because that might embarrass you. And Prof, these are all good enough reasons for us to invite you to present the keynote address today. But however, I'm more interested in your activist work that has led people to describe you as a leading educationist and a radical pedagogue. You are well known for your honest insights into the state of education, race and transformation, and you spare no one when you um, analyze and you comment on this. For example, <laughs> you once stated that South Africa has not escaped the debasement of higher education which you called a process which recasts the public space as a commodified sphere 
where students are regarded as consumers, academics as consultants, and top management in many respects as CEOs. Prof, we also know that your interests include education and social policy, but as these relate to social class, racism, transformation, social justice, human rights, and democracy, to critical and liberatory pedagogies, and to extensive involvement in participatory action research, transdisciplinary and comparative approaches to critically examining education policy and practice. And I think a lot of the last part, the latter part resonates with what Dr. Ray um, said in his opening address. So Professor Vali, we are looking forward to hearing your your words in your opening, in your, your keynote address, and it's over to you now. Thanks uh, very much for embarrassing me, Ms. Matty. <laughs> um, but thanks to you and Dr. Makwe for inviting me uh, to this very, very important discussion. Uh, but also thank you to Dr. Ray for supporting your work. Uh, and of course, profound respect for many of my colleagues who are part of this discussion and many who couldn't make it. Uh, not just colleagues in academia, uh, and a number of whom have been struggling for many decades to, uh, in a dedicated fight to realize quality education generally um, and adult work and community education more specifically. And uh, not just my colleagues in academia, but those in social movements in trade unions, but also, of course, officials in the department. Um, but most importantly, the people uh, in our country who every day show their thirst and their hunger uh, for education and often their disappointment, perhaps one should use a stronger language, betrayal uh, in not providing the quality education um, discussed in our policies, in our legislation, in our constitution, uh, but also uh, the promise in the struggle um, and made by various parties. So we owe it to them really um, to continue our struggle to realize uh, that aspiration. Now, um, I'm not sure if Sean is showing the logo and the out overview of the um, talk. There we go. Um, I think it's there. All right. Um, and I just want to just give you an idea of what I'll be talking about, and then I'm going to dispense with the uh, PowerPoint slides because I have a lot to say and I'm afraid that uh, it might become a bit fiddly. Um, well, uh, I'll talk to the history of various initiatives um, and uh, the initial uh, coming into being of an integrated education uh, system, the initial vision where it started, its provenance, its genesis, and what happened. And I think the third point for me is very, very key. Uh, I think that we really need to grapple with the dominant discourse, a discourse we hear all the time and too often are very glib about it. So we need to interrogate this discourse, the skills mismatch discourse, and of course, human capital theory uh, quite often is talked about um, in a very glib way and I think we need some critical uh, discussion about it. Then of course the white paper on post-school education and training. Um, it was a long discussion during the green paper process. 
um, and then finally the white paper 2013-2014. Um, the work of a number of my colleagues who are present here from about I think it's 10 different institutions uh, but put, put together by uh, some colleagues from DUT, the curriculum framework for uh, the advanced diplomas. And then, of course, the subject of this discussion, um, the lecturer education program and uh, educator professionalization. And I just want to make um, a few points there. So um, to start, I think that most people know that our country has a very rich and textured history of worker, adult and community education initiatives that go back to actually the early 1900s. Um, many people are familiar with the classes, the night schools uh, in 1919 onwards provided by the Internationalist League. Um, and then, of course, the South African Congress of Trade Unions, which held their first national school in 1956. Uh, and many other initiatives like uh, the South African Committee for Higher Education, Trust SACED, uh, which is a really important organization thinking about education for an alternative society during the period of um, apartheid. Um, from 1958, over many decades, uh, they developed uh, a responsive curricula that spoke to the political and educational uh, context of, uh, the, of the times. And of course, uh, uh, those of us who came uh, to consciousness in the 70s around the black consciousness movement and the importance community education uh, held for those who aligned themselves to the South African Students Organization, the Black Community Project uh, and other allied groups. Uh, the study circles that we were part of, the community reading groups and, and, and countless other initiatives. It was around the same time that groups like the University um, uh, Christian Movement, another uh, uh, student organization, also uh, uh, came into being and developed uh, an understanding of the importance of adult and community education. And of course, the UCM and the Black Consciousness Movement used a Frarian methodology to carry out literacy programs uh, and other community uh, initiatives. And of course, throughout the 80s, there was just really um, a mushrooming of initiatives in, in many areas. Uh, there was the involvement of faith-based groups, trade unions, NGOs, many community organizations, and the expression of alternative education, uh, non-formal, informal, popular education uh, could be found in all aspects of society, despite uh, apartheid. I think crucially, from the early 70s, really, the independent trade union movement was a vehicle for adult work education. Um, and really importantly, education was not restricted to the classroom or formal institutions, but instead um, all of life and its endeavors was seen as a potential classroom. Uh, trade unions became schools of labor. Uh, and in fact, various art forms became vehicles for education all kinds of gatherings were utilized as sites of collective learning. Um, and the resurgence of the independent, of the trade unions really, uh, uh, quickly renewed interest in, in worker education programs. 
and there were a number of educational projects. There was the urban training project. Um, there was uh, uh, groups aligned with the South African Students Organization and the Black People's Convention, uh, influenced by Paolo Freire, were also involved in non-formal education, setting up of black workers uh, projects in the early 70s. We know of the Institute for Industrial Education, the Industrial Aid Society, and I can go on. Really, it was a very vibrant period despite apartheid. There were many, many initiatives, but many of these initiatives ended um, at the dawn of uh, our new democracy. Um, and there are, of course, various interpretations of and debates around this demobilization. Uh, it uh, ranges from funding to energies towards building a new democracy, people from civil society, social movements, moving into government. Uh, and it was also a belief that uh, initiatives outside of government were no longer needed because liberation has come, to put it crudely, but of course, also the influence of corporate globalization um, existed a very strong uh, influence on post-1994 uh, policy, uh, uh, including that of education, our vision, our emphasis, our priorities, and a lot has been uh, written about that. Uh, the next point is the initial vision, which I think is really important because it arose from the workers' struggles in the 70s and 80s. And, and this was followed by strategic planning by uh, unions like MAU, the Metal and Allied Workers Union, and then later, of course, the National Union of Metal Workers. Uh, and they had a proposal to integrate education and training, uh, and they developed this uh, and, and, and largely they were motivated because of uh, wanting formal recognition for the skills of workers. Um, quite often it was working next to Nelly, that was the expression. It wasn't accredited uh, and because of the apartheid system, because of the Job Reservation Act, uh, but it was also linked to associated with pay increments. Uh, so there were various initiatives following this, and um, all of these were combined with the NUMSA concept, which provided the basis for an integrated training system. Um, and of course, many point to the meeting between the Department of Manpower, that's what it was called, actually, the Department of Manpower and the trade unions in 1992, I think it was, which saw the establishment of a working group. We know many of the individuals involved in that. And, and they developed a proposal that eventually saw the passing of the South African Qualifications uh, Authority of 1995. Um, and this in turn established the qualifi uh, um, uh, this established the Qualifications Authority which oversaw the NQF, the National Qualifications Framework. Uh, and the NQF, uh, not only did it map out all existing and new qualifications in one framework, but it also described the entire education system on eight levels divided into three bands. Now, I don't want to go into too much uh, detail. Uh, there's a lot to say about this, uh, but just to the important point is that um, one of the critical aspects and one that the NQF was critiqued for was that the qualifications had to be specified in terms of the exit level outcomes rather than in terms of duration of time or content to be covered. Um, and this meant that the entire education system also needed to be specified in terms of outcomes. Um, so the entire system had to be dramatically overhaul and the, the consequences of this new logic was there for all to see. Um, 
all forms of training were to be encoded on the NQF as part of whole qualifications. Knowledge had to be described in discrete units, known as unit standards, uh, that could be separately assessed. And many of us know the consequences of this. Uh, and there are questions posed by uh, Volker Wiedeken in a chapter in a book uh, Enver Motala and I edited called Education, Economy and Society. I think the, the title of Volker's chapter is in itself uh, revealing. Uh, it's titled Going Around in Circles, Employability, Responsiveness and the Reform of the College Sector. And he posed these questions. Who should be setting the standards? Was this the task of the educational institution, professional bodies, or the employers? Also, the training system that was established under the Skills Development Act of 1998 sought to incentivize, fund, and quality assure skills development through the introduction of a skills levy. Uh, and there was revenue that was uh, collected allocated to a national skills authority uh, and the establishment of a number of seat uh, sector education tra training authorities. Uh, so the point is that uh, these institutions or colleges, it was called FET colleges, prior to it being called TVET institutions, they were foregrounded as key institutions. And Volker asked the questions, what happened to these colleges between 1994 and 2000? And then from 2000 to 2012, that resulted according to many people and therefore new policy changes, new legislation, what resulted in this perception of the apparent failure to deliver on the promise of the skill system envisaged by the architects. This is what Volker asks. Uh, Volker provides an answer, which I'll share with you in a minute. But really, in order to appreciate, fully appreciate, his reasoning and others like him, uh, we need to have some knowledge of what is called the skills mismatch discourse and human uh, capital theory. Now it's fairly simple, uh, but many people don't see this uh, because daily we uh, are fed a diet um, of this kind of thinking, some call it market fundamentalism in the print media, in the electronic media. Uh, and, and, and normally their mantra is usually a permutation of the following cliches. The labor market is too rigid and inflexible. We must be competitive and entrepreneurial. We need more skills. Education fails to provide young people with skills for employment, et cetera, et cetera. You've heard all of this before, and it speaks to the dominant narrative. The skills mismatch discourse basically points a finger at education for not supplying the skills that business needs. Education is seen narrowly in an instrumental way and it is blamed for the mismatch between what education produces and what business wants. The cause of unemployment then, in general, is put unfairly, of course, at education's door, uh, more broadly arguing that education is not teaching what the economy needs. It is really unfortunately true that many children and youth in our country leave school without basic skills necessary for life and work. But really the mismatched discourse is usually less about basic skills and more 
about vocational skills. Uh, but also, they don't understand that unemployment is not a supply problem, but it's a structural problem of the system we live under, racial capitalism, and that quite often the demand side is just as important as the supply side. So underlying the skills discourse is the human capital discourse. Uh, education is seen as an investment in individual skills that makes one more productive and employable. Uh, and while this, I mean, I want to say is sometimes true, it is very partial at best. Um, so even abilities like literacy that we've heard, problem solving, critical thinking, teamwork, uh, can have payoff in the job market. Um, it can increase employability, but only in a context where such skills really um, uh, are valued. So the more useful and important question is the demand side one, usually uh, ignored by human capital theorists regarding how we can create decent jobs, not just blindly economic growth that causes so much environmental destruction, but decent jobs that require valuable skills that is promoted not just by the market, so the human capital discourse ignores the value of education outside of wage work. Um, and they have very little to say about the social reproduction of labor or incorrectly uh, and, and ignore, in fact, unpaid uh, work uh, of women, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so at this point, Many of you might be asking, what has this got to do with lecture, uh, lecturer professionalization and the college lecturer education program? Well, everything, I want to say, because this is because vocational and instrumental, instrumental learning based on human capital theory, while oriented to narrow economic interests, also really inculcates a particular philosophical orientation which shapes and affects how education educators lecturers view their roles and the purpose of vocational education uh, the beliefs they hold about their students the way in which they select use and design the curricula as well as how they facilitate learning um, and of course, a number of people have pointed out that one of the central concerns within this discourse is the role of vocational education institutions as democratic sites of learning in educating citizens and encouraging a commitment to social change and increasing levels of social equality in a country which has the highest inequality in the world. And that education should not be seen in a narrow view, just in terms of the labor market requirements of business, but in a broader view around social needs and the interests of community. But as I promised, the conclusion of Vox about the apparent failures of colleges to deliver on the promises um, uh, of the skill system uh, envisaged by the architects, and many has have worked with 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 Volker. I know uh, Wayne uh, might also be part of this discussion. Volker says the dominance of the responsiveness and employability framework nested within human capital theory has led to circularity in the reform process, hence going around in circles. He says, from the earliest policy documents to the current debates and proposed reforms, there has been little change in discourse. Of course, remember he was writing this about five years ago, and as we'll see, there has been some movement and we'll, we'll discuss that shortly. Vocational education and the lead institution colleges 
are seen as fundamental to solving a problem that is not primarily an educational problem. It's largely a problem of society, of the structure of society, of who makes decisions, who controls and who owns. So Volker talks about this continual anxious hand-wringing at the failures of the colleges and the VET system generally. And often this is followed by a new set of reforms that repeatedly aim at the same thing, making the colleges more responsive through curriculum reforms, capital investment and training. Um, and, and really, if one doesn't challenge this dominant discourse, then the colleges will fail, fail again because they cannot on their own address the underlying problem. But this, I, I have to say very quickly, is not to suggest that investment in the system, upgrading of facilities, funding students, improving the quality of lectures, the things we're doing is not needed. They are absolutely necessary um, and, and, and very significant. However, what needs to be changed are the measures against which these investments and reforms are judged. How do we judge them? You cannot reduce unemployment and you cannot judge them solely, solely by the degree to which the curriculum meets the, improve, uh, the approval of uh, the employers. Uh, what needs to be foregrounded is the educational role of the college in deepening knowledge uh, as many people have shown, uh, analyzed, done work around, developing some call it capabilities, including, I, I, I concede, hard and soft skills, um, strengthening of uh, occupational wider social identities, um, uh, and all of that. And a number of my colleagues here are doing incredible work around that. But I think crucially, one needs to adopt a political economy lens. Um, then the failure of the college sector to improve the employability of their graduates and significantly reduce unemployment may have less to do with the poor quality of the colleges and their weak linkages to industry. And it's more likely a feature of the structure of the economy and how economic policies have been implemented that privilege a particular model of growth. And this is the key point my presentation uh, wants to make. I can't be too comprehensive and there are many aspects to this, but I'm trying to break it down and I might come across in a crude way, but there's more than enough evidence to show that over 27 years, that the kind of transformation we're getting is not what we aspire to, other than the creation of a small black elite, and that the highest inequality in the world will continue, and that the 1% who own over 55% of the wealth will remain and it will become worse. Um, this is not to suggest, and I need to re-emphasize, reiterate the fact that colleges cannot improve um, life and possibilities, but they are not the panacea um, uh, and cannot be held solely responsible uh, for the limited creation of new jobs in the economy. Uh, I, I don't think I have much more time, I, I guess five minutes uh, at all. Please interrupt, uh, Michelle, if I'm running out of time. Um, but I think it was important that I mentioned the simplistic assumptions. There are just too many assumptions, and normally we work within those assumptions instead of challenging them uh, because as Volker and many others have shown that uh, uh, we will constantly uh, fail 
because of that. Uh, I think that viewed through a different lens, even if one doesn't use political economy, what is needed is a shift that sees education as enhancing capabilities in the learners for broader, broader developmental agenda. And we're not getting that. And people like Leon Tickley, McGrath, Leslie Powell, and others have, have sketched how this might be possible, the broad strokes of new theories of uh, development and what they might offer vocational uh, education. Very quickly, the white paper on post-school education and training offers promise. We need to ask whether it will make a difference. Uh, I'm not going to go through the background to the uh, white paper, the various debates, um, and uh, the organizational forms it's left us with, the community education training colleges, um, uh, how this might alter the post-school institutional landscape, the TVET colleges, universities. Uh, but just to say that uh, a few points uh, need to be bear, borne in mind. Um, that community and worker education remain two of the most poorly supported areas within PSET. Um, that the white paper is aware of this, speaks to it, and understands that research capacity building and anchored university-based sites, you know, at one point, even under apartheid, we had many more than we have today. Uh, but they've become largely marginal, in many cases, non-existent despite a recognition of their role in advancing critical citizenship and democracy. And this is a very important point acknowledged in the white paper on school education uh, and training. Um, and of course, it also understand, and it refers to uh, on page 23, uh, the effect of the closure of university-based adult education units uh, and how their catalytic functions have been inadequately supported. Um, uh, but the white paper ushers in renewed and important possibilities, as I mentioned, for the realization of progressive objectives, and the role of the community colleges, the importance of curriculum innovation, training and development of adult education, the establishment of a research program, building institutional capacity uh, and addressing really the underinvestment in adult education. Um, my colleagues, uh, Bachis, Ivor Bachis, Utando Baduza and, and uh, Sibia have written extensively about lecture educator professional, professionalization. Um, and I think all of us understand that educators in the vocation, vocational education system uh, in South Africa form part of a group of marginalized educators alongside other adult educators and early childhood development teachers because of their social position within the education field. Uh, but their status is further reinforced by the kind of technicist orientation to education, uh, the instrumentality that suppresses criticality. Um, and, and, and we realize, of course, the white paper realizes, and colleagues have realized that educators in vocational education in South Africa have limited pedagogical training. So I think the work uh, that our colleagues from the 10 institutions have been doing is important, but I think many have talked about how uh, competency-based education and training, uh, those approaches emphasizes procedural, technical knowers rather than reflective problem solvers. And going back to what I started talking about, standardize adaptable workers rather than initiators 
and critical human beings. So we need to ask whether the curriculum framework for the advanced diplomas developed by the Adult Community Education Unit at DUT, uh, written by Elder Leicester and Sandra Lan, in collaboration with a lot of our colleagues, 10 different institutions, how this will strengthen uh, post-school education training uh, and there are real possibilities. And what gives us hope is the important point made by them. And I'm moving towards my conclusion uh, in a few minutes, I promise. And the point they make, and I want to quote from this curriculum framework document, there is a drive at least at policy and curriculum level to redress some of the perennial problems which have beset the adult community education training system. Most notable amongst these have been the lack of or inadequate training of adult educators, the uncertain and some would say illegal employment conditions of adult educators, and over-ambitious and ill-defined curriculum changes, OBE being probably the most notable and notorious example, the asset field has been consistently under-resourced, lacks infrastructure, suffers from many problems that beset, that beset asset provision. For example, many of the target audiences are only able to attend part-time and, and must contend with competing demands of adult life, which are particularly onerous for women. There are many, many other details in what they point out. But I think Bachis and others have also pointed out that educators in vocational education have been recast as training entrepreneurs or so service providers. And in keeping with that kind of language, students are seen as customers. Uh, and this is because of the critical turn to market-driven uh, vocational education. So the urgency is to retrieve, renew, and advance education as a vocation in the way we see it, which is much broader and which talks to the issues of social justice, uh, which is transformative, uh, which is around a transformative pedagogy for vocational education. And here Freer has a lot to teach us about the democratic institutions has a lot to teach us about critical pedagogy. And uh, I've run out of time, but we need to discuss the fact that colleges, just like schools and universities, continue to experience an ongoing crisis. The budget cuts, and we're talking about 24.6 billion rand uh, of cuts by uh, our minister, Tito Mbueni, for higher education over the medium term expenditure framework, what effect will that have around the already inadequate finances and the consequences and the working conditions of uh, lecturers or education? And I want to end by saying that my colleague Ina Erna, Erna Senecal from Subset at NMU <laughs> has talked about professionalization as a double-edged sword. Um, it's also about situating educators as prime knowledge holders, promoting banking models of education, uh, and it could exclude and limit employment in times of austerity. There are many issues around that. It's also how certain notions of professionalism uh, see educators as deficient, irresponsible, um, uh, etc., having a deficit. Uh, but the importance is to repositioning prof professionalism as a transformative act, uh, including transformative capacity. Uh, and this is around how educators, lecturers can act in concert with learners, the communities they belong to, the agency. Um, and also not having a fetish around accreditation and formal education, but seeing the importance 
of alternatives, collective responses to inequality, poverty, oppression, ecological uh, destruction, uh, and actively building, as uh, Dr. Ray said, this critical civil society, social movements, where we will all act together uh, in opposing those who want to maintain a status quo that continues inequality, poverty, and uh, unemployment. I think I'll have to uh, stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Salim. Um, you definitely have not disappointed in terms of my expectations because you've completely thrown my thinking around the professionalization of our lecturers, but you've also given me such a great understanding of the background leading up to democracy and even after that, um, you know, the disappointments that we experienced um, in terms of the changes that we thought would happen. I don't see any questions in the in the comments. I do see um, some comments from uh, Sandra. I'm not sure, Salim, if you are able to see those or if I should read them out to you. Salim, are you able to see the comments? No. Uh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. I see them now. I see them now. Excuse me. I need a yes. lot of training with technology. There's lots and lots of comments. Okay. So the comments that I noted in particular um, around the um, what you have, have mentioned is from Sandra and from Mohammed um, and from Farrell and from Rasigan, um, who is thanking you very much for your excellent notes. Thank you for the keys to unlocking our progressive potentials, notwithstanding the intransigence of the political economy to transform. And Farrell and uh, Mohammed are speaking about universities um, also need to understand their roles critically. Sandra mentions that one cannot escape the impression that political will amongst those who could make a difference doesn't go further than window dressing. So maybe maybe no one knows what else to do. And I think on, on that note, I must say, I am bewildered by much of what you have said. And in terms of our role um, in this project and our branch, the university branch in particular, um, how is it that we go about trying to address the issues that you have raised in terms of our professionalization, whether it is a double-edged sword or not, but to bear in mind what you have just said. And, and I'm worried about the curriculum that has been developed. I know we have a curriculum framework that Sandra and her team have developed, but within the universities themselves, we are they developing their own unique curriculum. Um, the, the whole idea of human capital theory and transformative pedagogy, um, which is opposing that, it worries me that that kind of physical orientation that you speak of around human capital theory might somehow be transferred into our university curricula might shape our lecturers who are teaching the students who become college lecturers. And so um, I'm asking our university academics who are busy with these programs if I can, if you can just um, spend a minute or two trying to address that particular concern. If you could just, um, Sean, can you see hands? Or just um, indicate your name on the chat, and I will call on you to address that particular concern, because it is one that must be addressed. If it's not addressed in this session, then during the rest of the program, where I think program uh, development, et cetera, access and barriers, those are the actual items coming up. I'm hoping that that particular matter will be addressed by the participants. Um, so, Salim, I don't see anything else really. And as you say, we could spend hours talking about this, and we might probably do so when you can find some time. But thank you very much for your insightful presentation for the disruption 
that it has caused and always does cause when you speak to us. And definitely my my request for critical dialogue um, has has been proven. Um, there's evidence of that. And we certainly, from our side, have something to go back and think about when we consider the way forward in terms of our future projects and when we work with our colleagues in the community education and training branch. So thank you very much, Professor Vali. Right. OK, so colleagues, we move on to the next session. Um, and that is Dr. Maputa, who has a little bit of a, a difficult uh, task to achieve when he speaks to the responsiveness of the project to the CET sector needs, um, because it's all around professionalization. But I'm sure Dr. Maputa would be able to also address some of Salim's uh, issues in his um, in his uh, presentation. So Dr. Maputa is a deputy director in the teacher education director which I head in the university branch and his responsibility is to look after post-schooling and that includes both the um, community education and training colleges and the TVET colleges and he also heads up the college lecture education project. Uh, thank you Morgan, you can proceed. Thanks Michelle. I'm trying to share my document. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, colleagues, good morning, everyone. Uh, five years ago, a child was born in the teacher education directorate of the Department of Higher Education and Training and was given the name College Lecturer Education Project. The College Lecturer Education Project has two divisions, the Technical Education uh, Training and the ASET component. Last year in December, my colleague, Dr. Sepuka, has actually showcased uh, the work done so far in the TVET component. And this morning, I will be sharing with you the progress made so far in the ASET component of this project. And I will focus on how the lab has contributed to lecturer professionalization in adult and community education and training. In my presentation this morning, I will talk about the College Lecturer Education Project, a brief introduction, and this will be followed by program development status and implementation, the research project in CLEP ASAT, as well as capacity building and partnerships in the ASAT sector. Ladies and gentlemen, the CLEP ASAT focuses on the following main areas. Number one, to conduct an annual survey to determine the qualification status of lecturers at public CET colleges and develop an analytical report that informs national planning. And secondly, the main focus of the College Lecturer Education Project is to support universities to develop and offer professional qualification programs for the CET sector. And thirdly, the lab support universities to con conduct research in the CET sector in order to inform program development for lecturer qualifications. And finally, the main focus of this project is to support the development of new academics focused on ACT lecturer professionalization. In 2015, a policy in adult and community education and training was published. And this policy provided minimum requirements for programs leading to qualifications for educators and lecturers in the CET sector. In terms of this policy, a significant number of IH educators do not have qualifications for teaching in the IH sector. And historically, the IH educators 
held qualifications ranging from grade 12 school living certificates, diplomas, degrees to postgraduate degrees. And those who actually have professionally, uh, quali I mean, professional qualifications, they have qualifications that are recognized for teaching in schools. And then in terms of this policy, all previous qualifications are being replaced by the qualifications highlighted in this policy. And this policy actually provides the minimum requirements for qualifications of IT educators and CET lecturers employed in the community education and training colleges. Effective provisioning of the formal and non-formal offerings rely heavily on appropriately qualified, versatile, competent IH educators and CET lecturers, hence the college lecturer education, which focuses on professionalizing the CET sector. And the new CET lecturers, therefore, they need to be trained. And the IIT educators must be retrained in relevant subject content knowledge and methodologies that are appropriate for teaching youth and adults. I'm presenting to you, ladies and gentlemen, the ASAT programs. In the CLEP ASAT pro, uh, in the, in the at, CLEP ASAT, 10 universities are participating and they are developing the programs ranging from the higher certificate, the diploma, the advanced diplomas in the Bachelor of Education in ASAT. The higher certificate in ASAT, which is one of the programs developed in this uh, project, is actually an entry qualification which is intended to provide learners with basic introductory knowledge, cognitive and conceptual tools and practical techniques to enable further study in ASET. This qualification includes a will component and it is at NQF level five with 120 credits. On completion of the higher certificate, students may enroll for the diploma in ASET. And in terms of this diploma, students will be developed to become professionally competent educators and lecturers who can demonstrate focused knowledge and skills in order to teach or lecture a subject in ASET. In other words, this qualification requires a specific depth and specialization of knowledge together with practical skills and workplace learning. This qualification also includes a work integrated learning component. It is at NQF level six with 360 credits. Another qualification which has been developed by some of the participating universities is the advanced diploma in adult and community education and training teaching. We call this advanced deep ASET with double T. This qualification is not a standalone qualification. It provides a route for holders of appropriate degrees or diplomas to become professionally qualified ASAT lecturers. It accredits a professional qualification as an educator or lecturer in ASAT, but keeps an undergraduate quali qualification. And it also offers entry level initial professional pre preparation of graduates who wish to develop focused knowledge and skills as educators and lecturers in a particular subject that is offered in the ASAT sector. And this qualification requires a specific depth and specialization of knowledge together with practical skills and workplace experience. 
The second advanced diploma, which has been developed by some of the participating universities, is the advanced diploma in adult and community education and training. And this one has only one T as compared to the previous one, the double T. And the purpose of this advanced diploma with a single T is actually a continuing professional development qualification for ASAT lecturers they, who wish to strengthen and enhance an existing specialization in a subject or field or to develop a new role or practice to support teaching and lecturing in ASAT. This qualification offers intellectual enrichment or intensive focus and applied specialization, which meets the requirements of a specific niche in formal education in the context of adult and community education and training. In other words, in terms of this continuing professional development qualification, students may either specialize in areas such as inclusive education in adult education, curriculum studies in adult education, and or educational management and leadership in adult and community education and training. It is at MQF level seven with a total of 120 credits. In this table, ladies and gentlemen, I am presenting to you the participating universities together with the programs that they are developing and the accreditation status and the implementation date and or anticipated implementation date. So far, 10 universities are participating in the College Lecturer Education Project developing ASAT programs. And 13 programs have been developed. Out of the 13 programs that have been developed, one program has received provisional accreditation from CHE and five have already been accredited. In other words, they have received full accreditation. Out of the 13 programs that have been developed at participating universities, two have been submitted for CHE accreditation. And then three are undergoing processes for DHET policy compliance. And the last two, which are additional projects, are still undergoing internal institutional processes of approval. It is my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to announce that out of these 13 programs that are being developed at universities, already two, I mean three, have been implemented since 2020. And in 2021, two more programs will be offered. And it is anticipated that by 2023, all the 13 programs will be offered at participating institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, the College Lecturer Education Project also focused on the research projects as one of its key deliverables. And research projects have been implemented at participating universities and the three leading institutions were the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, the Durban University of Technology, and the University of the Western Cape. The Cape Peninsula University of Technology, ladies and gentlemen, played a major role in implementing a project on the effective delivery of the work integrated learning component of the ACET lecturer qualification programs. And this project was led by the late Dr. Andre van der Beyl and Ms. Vanessa Taylor. May Andre van der Beyl rest in peace. Secondly, the Durban University of Technology also contributed a lot 
towards leading a research project towards the development of curriculum frameworks for the advanced diplomas in adult and community education and training. I hope Dr. Sandra Land will actually talk to this uh, aspect. And secondly, the Durban University of Technology has also implemented a research project titled, Who are the ACET educators and what are their development needs? The University of the Western Cape also implemented a research project on access, participation, success, and barriers that affect post-school education and training under the coordination of Professor Zelda Gruner. Dr. Hendricks also coordinated a research project on the development of a curriculum framework for the diploma in adult and community education and training. Professor Joy Papir also led the establishment of an academic journal of post-school education and training known as the Jova Set, which received full accreditation in February 2021. It is my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to announce that all these research projects are being finalized. The College Lecturer Education Project also played a major role towards building capacity at participating universities, also strengthening partnerships between universities and other relevant stakeholders. So far, young academics have been employed to play a role in, career, I mean, in program development and implementation of the new programs. 65 MED and PhD students have been supported in this project and a number of students have graduated. Some are finishing their research reports and this is really work well done. I would really love to appreciate the work done by the supervisors and the students. And partnerships have also been developed in this project. For example, the Department of Higher Education and Training worked hand in hand with universities and colleges in developing the programs and also in the initial implementation of these programs. We also worked together with the CETAS for funding purposes because some of the participating universities have started implementing these programs. So funding is one of those requirements. So CETAS actually play a role towards funding the students at this point. The participating universities together with the Department of Higher Education and Training also work collaboratively with the community learning centers where students will be placed for work integrated learning. So far, a total of 13 articles have been published as part of this project. And some articles have been submitted to accredited journals for publication. Academics and students have attended national and international conferences where papers emerging from the programs have been presented. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, it is not yet Uhuru. As the Department of Higher Education and Training is embarking on the closeout processes of the College Lecturer Education, we are actually committing ourselves we are actually looking forward towards successful 
implementation of the ASAT projects, I mean, programs at participating universities. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you so much for that, Morgan. Um, you've been working on this for many years now, and so this is this is your baby. Um, but I, I think as chair, I must also play devil's advocate uh, when it comes to the work that we have done. And so the couple of things uh, just to to mention about the programs is that we are not too sure whether the universities will be able to attract enough students to undertake those programs. We are not too sure whether those students will be able to access funding. I know we have opportunities through MERCETA and through the ETDP CETA, but whether that will be a reality or not is not within our uh, mandate, not within our control. I would also like to say that the service conditions and the employment sites of the graduates is not something that we can control. Um, and it's not passing the buck, but it's basically being honest about what it is that we can do to improve within our capacity. The issue around the partnerships now, Minister said in the National Development Plan that he wants to see partnerships between colleges and universities um, when they are developing programs. And at this point, I know that there has been some partnership engagement, but I don't know whether all 10 universities have actually worked with community colleges and community organizations to understand what the needs are and for them to have a look at the curricula and make suggestions on what must be changed, what should be included. And I'm cognizant of Salim's comments around what is valued, what wage-based um, value on certain specializations, et cetera. What we do within the um, the department is that we um, we evaluate the programs that come through us in terms of their compliance against the policy that was developed. Uh, so it's it's almost like a technicist approach where we make sure that the points fall in line with the different learning uh, knowledge areas, etc. And we have some uh, leeway in terms of the content, but. Otherwise, the universities have the right to include the content. They have the autonomy to include the content that they think is, is necessary, that is appropriate. Uh, CHE would look at that content. But my understanding and my assumption is that whatever content is put into our programs, that that has been uh, collaboratively undertaken with some suggestions and engagement with colleges um, and, and uh, community organizations. Uh, the last point I wanted to make is that the the support of the academics, the, uh, the students has been absolutely amazing. Um, and the research that has been developed, Sandra's work on uh, who are the, who are the, uh, Sandra, who are the ASIC educators and what are their needs is crucial to the sector. So the universities should have a look at that as well as a report that Morgan develops um, for the CET branch based on um, uh, the, the needs and the qualifications that the current uh, educators or lecturers have in the colleges and uh, which programs uh, and qualifications they must undertake to, to be, you know, to become professionals in that particular area. But otherwise, I, I want to thank Morgan very much for what he's done in this project and what has been achieved. We know it's a, it's been a neglected area and there have been really leaps and bounds made in terms of the products. I see Wayne has also said, Morgan, well done, precious, great presentation, Morgan, and 
Zerole says an insightful presentation, Mr. Maputa, and we hope for a swift and successful implementation of the programs. So thank you very much. I don't see any questions, just those comments. And uh, Noel Daniels from Cornerstone, welcome to the meeting. And of course, we, we do hope that we can work with you and that you can work with others in terms of what you do at Cornerstone. Oh, I see something from Tumilo, and I know that we're running five minutes behind. But Tumila, I'm going to ask, read out your question. Sean, if we can put that up um, on the screen as well, please. Uh, the question from Tumilo is, how can CET colleges be assisted in terms of upgrading and reskilling these underqualified lecturers, since it is known that the current qualifications are generic. Colleges are expected to diversify. And when our colleague, uh, Dr. Diale from CET makes his presentation, Tumela, I am I'm asking if he could please address that uh, question that you have asked. It's very pertinent as well. Um, so thank you very much. I'm going to move on to the next session. The next activity or presentation in this session, and this is one entitled Access, Barriers to Participation and Success in Post-School Education and Training. So Professor Zelda Groene from UWC, who has led up this particular research project, is going to make a presentation on this. And I like the fact that um, it's not just the success that has been experienced, but also barriers which you will speak to. Thank you, Professor Groene. Hi, Michelle. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I can hear you. I'm trying to. Hello, Michelle. Can, I can you hear, hear me? You. Yes. I uh, am trying to uh, share my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, yesterday we were not successful. I've sent it to Sean, so hopefully he can assist. Sean, are you able to assist? Sean says he's awaiting your email, Zelda. And I think I've sent. I've sent. Okay. So if it's not it's not with him yet, he has indicated it's not with him yet. So I'm going to ask that we move to the next presentation to give him time to receive yours. Sean, is that okay with you? Can we move on to the next one? Okay. I'm waiting for some comment from Sean. Okay, Sean says that's fine. So we move on to the next presentation, which is a very interesting one in terms of what Dr. Ray, as well as Salim has indicated regarding the fourth IR. So this is about adult education in the era of the fourth industrial revolution. We have uh, two people on the panel, Professor Miraj from TUT and Dr. Schlatzweyer from UJ and Ms. Hamilton from UJ is facilitating. Uh, Ms. Hamilton, over to you. Thank you. All right. It seems as though we have a problem that Ms. Hamilton has not joined. Mr. Miraj, do you know anything about that? Uh, she was online earlier. Uh, this could be some of the challenges we have when we keep talking about a fourth industrial revolution without <laughs> connectivity. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so we need to develop some critical consciousness around the use of technology, <laughs> especially in our 
um, environments and our context. Um, so it seems as though we have a little problem. But let's see how we can, um, if you can send an email to Ms. Hamilton or a WhatsApp message, I would appreciate that. And I know Sean is probably asking her the same thing. Um, but otherwise, uh, Dr. Miraj and Dr. Schlatweo, would the two of you be able to engage in a discussion on your own around this particular topic? I, I don't know what the questions were, but I can try to, to manage that space with you and just indicate who speaks when. Okay, so uh, thanks very okay. much, Michelle. I think Mondley is trying to get hold of uh, uh, Sherry as we're speaking. I see him on the phone. So we had three questions. Uh, yes. Why should communities engage uh, with fourth industrial revolution? The second question, what kinds of pedagogies uh, yes. are important? And the third question, how should adult and community educators specifically then engage with this new technological uh, uh, concepts? So those were the three questions. And I think, uh, um, while we wait for uh, Sherry, um, uh, I All want right. to just ask across you, if you don't mind. Mondley, yes. do you want to maybe take a, a, a stab at starting and we can just pick up and maybe Sherry will join us as we move? Uh, you need to unmute as well, the famous... <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, I was trying to get a hold of her. Yeah, there please. she is. She's, She's coming up now. now. She's Let's coming up now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay. I think it's ironic that you guys are presenting on the fourth industrial revolution, and here we get this <laughs> coming from you. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's always a, a backup plan. Hmm. So, Shiri, I can see that you have joined. I just don't see your video. Mm. Okay, Professor Maraj, um, I think let's take your, your lead on this. Dr. Schlossweyer, oh, if you could address the first question on why it is that adults and com I think it is why should we... Um, Community, okay. yes, in terms of this yeah. food IR. Yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, I think the first point I want to make is that uh, discussing food IR under these, these conditions, it's a very strange <laughs> phenomenon. Right? And uh, it has to do with the fact that uh, South Africa, you know, as, as our country, has not realized a number of what can be regarded as critical you know, technological revolutions, right? Mm. Uh, let me give you one example. I mean, we talk about the the first industrial revolution started in, in uh, 1760, right? And uh, within that, we talk about the, uh, the, the, the establishment of the railway systems, uh, the use of the steam uh, engine and uh, the steam engine trains, right? Now, we don't have a proper uh, transport system that can mm. take care of the public, right? So our railway systems have been destroyed. They are dysfunctional. And uh, there is a big problem. So I'm just mm. giving you an example of the first uh, industrial revolution, which actually take play, uh, took place here later on, but but, but still we haven't realized you know, those um, you know, you know, uh, uh, goals of, of that revolution, right? Secondly, we talk about the second you know, technological revolution, which is largely about electrification. Hmm. And it's very interesting to know that, um, you know, first town in the southern hemisphere to, to install electric street lighting was Kimberley, that, that was in 1882, right? So, hmm. but now, which is 2021, we still have 
the crisis which is called load shedding, right? And uh, that load shedding is, uh, is, is, is actually imp imp impacting on, on, the, on the country's ability to deliver electricity efficiently, but, but also it has an impact on what is called online learning because you can't use online learning when you don't have electricity, right? Something which was uh, delivered in 130 years ago. Um, but of course, we, we can argue that was under you know, no racial capitalism and the, the racist regime then, right? But another point that I also want to make is that when it comes to you know, transportation, which is the, the point that was uh, raised by Comrade Salim Value, that, you know, we don't have uh, access to those uh, you know, tools, Right, so it, it it then becomes a big problem for your adult uh, learners who who tend to study at night, and as as as, as especially those who are uh, women. Right now, the the, the third you know, technical uh, technological revolution, which we began in the late nineteen sixties. Uh, now again, that was about high cities, uh, which is the in information communications you know, technology that has not been realized you know you know we, we talk about online learning uh, you know, learners um, you know uh, students uh, at universities uh, i don't want to talk about you know, other learners um, they don't have access to gadgets computers and uh, we don't have icts infrastructure so so i think that is why i'm saying that when we're talking about this uh for IR, it's 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 really like the pie in the sky which is why i'm saying that look maybe let's talk about the digital divide which is you know characterizing mm -hmm. our society and also how do we ensure that we we address all these uh you know, problems uh, of of the the, the 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 infrastructure, so that the learners can also have access to electricity, can have access to you know the 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 ICT. So all all I'm saying is that first things first. Okay, I'm I'm just gonna stop there for now. I can go on and on. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you, um, Wanli, for that. I didn't get to introduce you first, uh, but let me <laughs> do that now. Um, Wanli Schlatzwey is a senior researcher in the Center for Education Rights and Transformation at UJ. He worked mm -hmm. previously for Kenya College, a Johannesburg-based NGO, as an educator and a researcher. And at the moment, his, his areas of interest have moved towards precarious work also migrant work, and in the past he's worked on World Cup and Stadia, and, uh, but he's also um, very interested in the work of unions and how they've responded to technological changes. So uh, he's also co-published uh, with uh, Aziz, um, Dr. Aziz Chowdhury, and has produced a number of publications, chapters in books, journal articles, and so on. Um, so that's uh, Dr. Mondli Latswayo for you, and I must apologize for uh, coming in a bit late. I had technological issues, and then, uh, um, yeah, so my apologies for that. So I'm going to move over to uh, Professor Rasikan Maharaj, who's the Chief Director of the Institute of Economic Research and Innovation at Swana University of Technology. He's been involved as, a, or rather, he was a professor extraordinaire at the Center for Research on Evaluation Science and Technology at Stellenbosch University. And um, he's also uh, was the node head of the DSI NRF, NRF Center uh, of Excellence in Scientometrics and Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy. 
and a ministerial representative to the Council of Rhodes University. Um, so I'm not going to go any further than that, uh, Rasigan, but I'm going to just hand over to you to respond to the three questions that uh, we sent to you about why should mm -hmm. communities engage with 4IAR, mm -hmm. what kind of pedagogies should be developed in response, and how should adult, worker, and community education educators engage with 4IR. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mondi was meant to have uh, focused specifically on the economic and social aspects of that question. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you now to please uh, you know, refer to the technological mm -hmm. and political aspects of how we can go about responding to these kinds Excellent. of questions. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sherry. Uh, uh, greetings, colleagues, and greetings, to, every, uh, greetings to everyone that's online. Um, um, uh, and thanks very much, Mondi, for the excellent lead into uh, these questions itself. You know, um, I want to start like Mondi did, also with reminding us about history. And it's quite important in terms of us appreciating the fact that over the long run of our evolution, we are constantly gathering new insights about the world around us. And with the accumulation of information about what's happening around us, access to that information becomes critical. And that's why I, I, I want to also encourage and pick up on what Sherry's mentioned, the technological angle. The uh, components of the fourth industrial revolution provide to us a medium through which we can engage. Mondley mentioned this as information and communications technology. But technology is also content in terms of the knowledges that we choose to utilize to transform into technologies itself. Because of the, uh, that uh, uh, duality, it's absolutely critical that the communities, the educators, uh, and everyone is involved in accessing the knowledge and are afforded the opportunity to also co-construct knowledge. But if we are lacking, again, as Mondi correctly pointed out and Salim had hinted at this earlier, if the basic and fundamental components that allow us to live a decent life under the current regime of capital is not available to all, then we will face the inequalities that we are currently confronted by and see those inequalities actually get compounded and extended through these technological means as well. So Sherry, it, it's not just the challenge of us connecting, but it's also of us staying connected. And this is what COVID-19 has brought right up to our faces. You know, we are confronted by needing to be socially distant physically, but we have the means available to us to stay connected, except it's pay as you go. And those that can pay and afford access are the ones being privileged. So that also provides a sense of how those with current advantages extend those advantages. And those that we in South Africa have become, I, I would say, uh, too numb to the idea, we keep calling it historical disadvantage. But as we heard, even from the presentations made by Michelle and the colleagues from the section, are we doing enough to transform the session such that history actually uh, is things in our past and that we do not continue to refer to historical disadvantages 30 years into a trans transition in South Africa. So within what I've raised now, not only is it important for us to access the information, but it's also important for us to have uh, um, universal and I would suggest even free access to the means. In other words, these are new utilities that are formed. Very much as we can access water or we should be accessing electricity, we should also be having access to the digital means. Uh, uh, at that point, I, I want to also maybe um, hint at 
a particular challenge that we see arising around us, which is the rise of disinformation, alternative facts, and uh, a component where we have expertise about areas like epidemiology that arises from people spending a few minutes on social media, as opposed to the years of research that go into actually understanding uh, uh, very serious um, and challenging areas of research. So, in terms of us mediating that and ensuring that we have positive outcomes, I want to re-emphasize that we cannot exclude uh, the components of the fourth industrial revolution. But Mondley correctly pointed out, this is about digitization. And let's not fixate or make a fetish about the number, but get on with ensuring people have access, ubiquitous, uni uh, universal, and free access to information and the means through which that information is transmitted. I think if we keep things at basics, we also stand the chance of actually succeeding in what we want to achieve, as opposed to overcomplicating and making complex matters that don't allow us the agency to realize our objectives. The last point for me then really picks on what the um, representative from the European Union mentioned earlier today. I don't think in South Africa that we lack criticality, but we do and people are then uh, not afforded the opportunity to engage in this in a critical enough manner. So whereas I agree fully in upgrading our pedagogic skills, we need to know the content areas. But colleagues, we also have to uh, allow an element of skepticism. Yeah? Everything in the textbook is not to our advantage. And we really must be in a situation when we ourselves, from our own experiences, are not only rewriting the textbooks, but are writing texts that are appropriate and relevant to our own developmental needs. And for that, we must really be extremely concerned by those that evangelize uh, what Mondley, I think, kindly referred to as pie in the sky. Yeah. While our colleagues down in uh, uh, the university section in Cape Town are investing in rocket technology, maybe those elements will help us even reach out to the pie in the sky and so that we can get a share of it. We, uh, what I mean by this is we are investing in many narrow research fields. These research fields can be combined to offer us progressive alternatives, but we must reintegrate our knowledges and not allow them to continue to be segmented and leading down the line to increase our wage slavery. Thank you very much. Eh? Thank you, uh, Rasigan. Um, now I'd like to turn to the audience, uh, our online audience, to see if there are any questions, comments on the inputs. Um, I think that uh, the, you know, both Mondi and Rasigan have uh, talked about how we could possibly respond to to the question of adult education and the 4IR. I'm I'm reminded by uh, a quote from the former U.S. Secretary of State who warned that, uh, and this was before the pandemic, that we are in the midst of a sweeping technological revolution whose consequences we have failed to fully reckon and whose mm. culmination may be a world relying on machines powered by data mm. and algorithms and ungoverned by ethical and philosophical norms. So mm. these are, you know, the kinds of questions that, in a sense, adult education also needs to take on in terms of, you know, given that, you know, some of the predictions and studies have shown that, you know, in China, possibly 57% of jobs in semi-skilled areas will be replaced by artificial intelligence and robots and all of that. And similarly, in the U.S., uh, similar predictions are made. And this, you know, given the laws of combined and uneven development will certainly have uh, an impact in developing countries. So in a sense, it, it does focus the mind about what it is that we are teaching. Mm. Um, and, and as adult educators who are at the you know, the front line of first responders to education in that sense. 
uh, we have a particular responsibility to, to take on these kinds of questions in a way that, mm. um, you know, uh, will, will, will get us all engaged in coming up with solutions because all mm. of these changes are, in fact, uh, can, can be of huge benefit to society. We know yes. that. We've, mm. we've seen the mm. possibilities um, in mm. the last period with the pandemic. But in whose interests? At the, in the final mm. analysis, you know, are these changes mm. happening? Uh, how do they benefit uh, the majority of the people in society? So these are questions that we have to uh, grapple with. Uh, and as I said, mm. as people who uh, can, you know, educate to implement tomorrow what we learn today, uh, mm. it places an even heavier responsibility on our shoulders. So um, I don't see any comments. Uh, so if not, uh, I think we are uh, in time. So uh, mm. if our hosts can let us go, if there are no further questions, thank you very much to Rasikan and Wandli. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. I know you came in a bit late, but you've forgiven because you've managed that session and given us some insight in terms of your quotation. I also want to thank Rasigan and Monli as well. But if you could indulge me, I, I found a quote from Bell that speaks to both of the presenters. And the one, one quote that Bell says is that technology and technological skills are important uh, within the existing economy, uh, but not within the existing economic system and the political and social framework that sustains it. So I think only this echoes what you very honestly uh, indicated to us. And then with regard to Rasigan and about the pedagogy, students must be equipped to ask critical questions uh, about the political economy of technology, about the pedagogy, and about social implications of educational technology. And how they can best do that is through critical consciousness. So that's certainly food for thought for those of us who think that access to data and being able to use a laptop should be all that we, we can um, develop and be able to do. Thank you very much for for the uh, the item, and I will now move on to um, Professor Hruner. Uh, we sorry, Professor, that we were not able to access your presentation, but you can go ahead now. I am cognizant that we're running a bit late because uh, Professor Hugo's session must end at ten thirty, and we have a ten minute break thereafter. Um, so um, I'm hesitant to ask you if you could make it uh, 20 minutes rather, but um, I'll leave that up to you. Thank okay, you. so thank you, Michelle, uh, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, Michelle, um, I shall try for uh, 20 minutes. Um, Okay. Can everyone see? Sorry, is everyone okay? Okay, can I start? Um, okay. Uh, in my presentation, I will uh, present a report on the project. Uh, which I coordinated, the research project, and relate it to some critical issues related to access, barriers to participation and success. Next slide. Uh, I want to start with a statement um, uh, and, and echo what Salim Vali and others have said this morning, and that is that public ASET is underfunded. Uh, expanding access to ACET requires substantial funding to meet the demands of expanding access to excellent quality ACET qualifications, professionalization is required. Um, the pro professionalization of ACET requires a substantial increase in government's budget to employ full-time community college lecturers who are in permanent positions and can realize the successful expansion of access to adult uh, to ACET. 
as the majority of adult learners who seek access to ACET are disadvantaged black adults, both access to ACET and the professionalization of ACET lecturers are equity and social justice imperatives. And I want to emphasize that. Next slide. I want to um, remind us um, what uh, uh, was said, what is said in the white paper. Uh, Deep-seated inequalities are rooted in our past. It is not by accident that the remaining disparities of wealth, educational access and attainment, health status and access to opportunities are still largely based on race and gender. Next slide. To address such racial and gender inequality, the DHET proposes, education has been long recognized as providing a route out of poverty for individuals and as a way of promoting equality of opportunity and that the achievement of greater social justice is closely dependent on equitable access by all sections of the population to quality education. Next slide. Uh, I want to remind uh, us uh, of government's targets that they set for equitable access to ACET uh, and the community college sector. Uh, it is envisaged that community colleges will have a headcount enrollment of 1 million by 2030 as compared to the 265,000 in public adult learning centres in 2011. I make the assumption that government's intention to create 1 million learning opportunities in community colleges and other initiatives by 2030 is to target disadvantaged black adults' equitable access to post-school education and effect post-school education as a route out of poverty for individuals. The research project funded by the DHET EU partnership converges with government's intention to expand access to ACET and the community college sector by achieving 1 million learning opportunities. Next slide. So the research project um, is uh, entitled Access, Participation, Success and Barriers that Affect These in Post-School Education and Training. The main focus has been on adult learners access and barriers to participation in post-school education and training. The project deliverables focused on adult learners access and barriers in participation to post-school education and training uh, and these included conference papers, journal articles and masters and PhD students. Next slide. A conference was um, uh, held, uh, or rather, we convened a conference uh, in 2018 uh, at um, uh, in, in Cape Town, and uh, the focus of the conference was on uh, access barriers and success, rethinking equity and social justice to post-school education. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, sorry, next slide. Fifteen conference papers were presented by DHET supported students. Uh, there was a total of 50 conference papers at the conference. Um, I mention a couple, a few here. Access barriers and participation to success among adult students at a TVET college. Uh, another one focused on mature adult students at a TVET college in the Western Cape. Uh, another one um, with the focus on um, the case of primary health care workers. Uh, and another one focused on community caregivers training in Gauteng. Next slide. Um, one of the deliverables, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, included uh, journal articles and um, uh, Professor Shirley Walters and myself, uh, we co-edited a special issue, next slide, of the Javaset Journal. Uh, nine journal articles were published 
uh, I mentioned uh, there are, uh, sorry, um, one or two uh, titles which I'd like to mention, uh, which is um, uh, Rethinking uh, Equity and Social Justice in Post-School Education, uh, What's in it for me, Barriers to Participation and Adult Learning in Small Communities of Western Canada. Next slide. Um, we are working on a proposed book uh, that is um, uh, Dr. Sandra Land and myself are co-editing a book entitled Adult L Education and Learning Perspectives, Access Barriers to Participation and Success Under Crisis in South Africa. And it focuses on the current context of social crises, which relate to the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, as well as other social crises like climate change and so forth. Next slide. Um, there are six masters, six master students have graduated and there are six completions pending. I mentioned some of the master's research paper titles. Uh, there were two that focused on um, uh, models um, which uh, analyze um, barriers. One is a psychosocial interaction model and uh, the other one is uh, a chain of response model. Next slide. Uh, there were three papers uh, which focus on student persistence. Um, uh, and access uh, in uh, Tibet College, a faith-based faith uh, higher education institution, a foundation program at a university in the Western Cape and a Tibet College in the Western Cape. Next slide. Um, there were three um, uh, master's research papers which focused on adult students, in particular at Northlink College, College of Cape Town, University of the Western Cape. And next slide. The last three, uh, which I mentioned, focused on agency in particular. And uh, one of the students who graduated and myself published uh, an article um, uh, and it was entitled Tivet Colleges and Access to Higher Education, Keeping the Dream Alive. I'll just read the abstract. Uh, scholars uh, suggest a dearth of research about the reasons that underpin enrollment at Tivet Colleges in South Africa. Um, in their emerging theoretical perspectives on student access and Tivet College success in Tivet Colleges, Powell and McGrath draw on theories of agency to explain the reasons that students access Tivet Colleges. Uh, what we found was that uh, students um, uh, experienced uh, several barriers, uh, but upon completion of their studies at the Tibet College, uh, their desire as agents of change to continue the changing the course of their lives was further evident in their future intentions to enroll in a higher education institution. The empirical evidence suggests that TVET colleges can also be characterized as access colleges providing students with a ladder into higher education. Next slide. Uh, uh, they are uh, PhD students uh, in the project, and I uh, mentioned three titles here uh, of PhD studies. Uh, one in particular, the first one, an analysis of workplace learning for community health workers in the healthcare sector within the South African context using a post-colonialism, Afrocentrism and decolonization lens. Next slide. I now want to just uh, mention very briefly a journal article which I published uh, in the special issue. Uh, and um, which focuses on uh, rethinking um, social justice and equity related to access. Um, mentioning, um, I'll just, uh, due to time, I'll just uh, read the last three lines, drawing on theoretical frameworks and secondary data. I conceptualize a distributive uh, justice perspective on access for disadvantaged black adults, premised on the relationships between interrelated equality rights and socioeconomic rights, principles of social ju economic justice and redistributive policies. Next slide. 
I want to return to the statement that the opening statement um, and focus the last uh, few slides on um, on this particular issue in relation to access and barriers. Public ASET is underfunded. The critical question is how can government realize for disadvantaged black adults equality rights and socioeconomic rights that achieve fair equality of opportunity and equitable access to post-school education as a route out of poverty and as a social justice benefit. Next slide. To engage with this question, I offer a distributive justice perspective that is predicated on the relationships between equality, interrelated equality rights and socioeconomic rights, principles of social justice and distributive policies. And there are four building blocks uh, disadvantaged black adults, interrelated rights and socioeconomic rights, social and economic justice principles, and redistributive policies and social assistance. Next slide. I want to refer to the um, to four uh, social and economic justice principles in relation to access and post school education. The first one is advantage to disadvantaged black adults. The second one is equal right to post-school education for disadvantaged black adults. The third one, conditions of fair equality of opportunity for disadvantaged black adults. The fourth, redistribution above and beyond the minimum threshold for disadvantaged black adults. And the fifth one is non-racial radical redistribution for disadvantaged black adults. Next slide. So I'd like to just focus on access to post-school education in, in the last, in the concluding slides and interrelated equality rights and socioeconomic rights. And I want to add that in the last while, um, well, since the pandemic, um, uh, since since lockdown, essentially, um, and the crisis which the lockdown has created, uh, there has been a, a focus on socioeconomic rights uh, in different spheres of society. And I want to just emphasize that here as well. So the co Constitution uh, includes adult basic education as an equality right. Um, uh, next slide. Fredman, however, uh, stresses the importance of socioeconomic rights. And I want to quote her. She says, the South African constitution has the advantage of containing express socioeconomic rights. However, these rights are not qualified. They do not give rise to immediate entitlements, but instead require the state to take reasonable measures within available resources to realize the right progressively. Then Fredman proposes that the interrelatedness between equal rights and socioeconomic rights should be recognized for the purposes of reducing poverty, declaring that the equality guarantee can considerably strengthen socioeconomic rights as a response to the potential and limitations of an equal rights paradigm in addressing poverty. Next slide. Thoughts about future research, about access barriers to participation and success. I think we need to contextualize research about access and barriers and success within the context of rising unemployment, deepening poverty and increasing inequality induced by the COVID-19 pandemic crisis and social crises of various kinds. We need to investigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis on ASET and I'd be very interested to hear in the next uh, presentation how this has occurred. We need to investigate how ACET responds to social crises. We need to investigate how interrelated equality rights and socioeconomic rights under conditions of deepening social crises can inform government spending to expand access to ACET. And we need to investigate how social justice principles 
can continue to be active, advocated for redistributive policies, mechanisms, and strategies that contribute to expanding access to ACET and professionalizing ACET under deepening social crises. Next slide. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention and uh, to thank uh, the Department of Higher Education and Training and the EU for the funding and for organizing this webinar. Thanks. Thank you so much, Zelda, for always um, presenting in a calm and measured way. And yet the um, amount of work that you have done, you know, is, I feel, almost uh, understated. I want to thank you for the um, the your some of the items that you mentioned for example that social and economic justice uh, principles must be undertaken in regard to access salim indicated that psychosocial barriers um, are very important although they are, have been neglected so that's perhaps something for you to think about or you already have um, discussed that in the work that you have done but your point around access to education and its relationship to, I think, is it Section 9 in the Constitution? When you speak about uh, Fredman, is it? I can't remember the name of the person who Fredman. indicated that, that that particular right almost seems to give um, immediate entit entitlement to education and that it should be changed to note that government can do this within reasonable measures. I think it's it's um, very, um, uh, uh, almost not a coincidence, but I think it's synchronicity that you bring this up in a period during which we as DHET and the universities are going through a very stressful time around fees, protest action, violence around that as well. Um, and so I'm not too sure uh, what you would say in response to that. So am I correct in understanding that that right would probably need to change if possible? Are you saying that students need to be more cognizant of the fact that there is limited funding or what is your perception around that? I'm sorry to put you on the mm -hmm. spot here, but it is um, interesting for us from DHET to, to think about that. Michelle, I think that, uh, um, you know, the point about uh, socioeconomic rights and, uh, you know, what you said, that it has to be realized um, within reasonable time. I, uh, you have put me on the spot. I think that we are a society in crisis. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, when these crises deepen as they are, there are contradictions between intentions and what government can deliver. Yeah. I have deliberately today not actually taken into account or mentioned budget cuts. I know that Salim Vali mentioned it. I find it extremely useful. I know that I can be crit criticized for being idealistic. But uh, if we are rethinking access and barriers to participation in a, con in, in a context of deepening crises, mm -hmm. I would like our webinar to almost disregard budget cuts. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is a constraint, but and of course we have to think within these constraints. But at the same time, I think we need to liberate ourselves beyond those those budget constraints. And I think yes. we need to be we need to be true to the constitutional imperatives, mm. which commit us to deliver on human rights and socio economic mm. rights. Mm. 
Thank you so much for that honest uh, opinion and also for rising to the occasion despite my very ad hoc question to you. Um, just as a matter of interest, Professor John Aitchison says that having one million learners in ACET by 2030 has to be fantasy as it assumes a 50% growth in enrollments each year. Mm -hmm. um, so Dr. Diali is from the CET branch and I'm sure he'd be interested mm -hmm. in that comment, John. Um, mm -hmm. The, Could I add, uh, Yes, yes, Alda. You know, I think uh, uh, something I didn't mention, um, but I'd like to mention it now. Uh, there's some very interesting work being done by Saldru, um, by, um, uh, in that they are trying to track uh, mm -hmm. progress, so to speak, towards the 22%. Uh, mm -hmm. of adults they so so sorry um in terms of the development girls uh 22 percent of adults aged between 15 and 64 should have qualifications by uh, or we should have achieved the 22 percent by 2030 so it would be it you know i think we need to find ways of tracking and tracing uh, and uh, our, our progress, so to speak, towards yes. achieving that goal. But I am I take in I take cognizance of what John Aitchison yes. says, yes. and I wonder if there isn't an opportunity for us to, at some stage, talk about the crisis which we yes. with the the crisis which relates to achieving those twenty thirty goals. Yes. Some of which. The crisis which has been induced in part, partially, by COVID-19, but mm. social crises which predate uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Yes. Thank you once again, Zelda, for that. And I think that certainly gives us food for thought in terms of what we can continue to do together with the CT branch uh, to talk about these crises because 2030 is not too far away. I mean, I'll be retired by then, but it would certainly be interesting to see whether we do reach those goals and with the kind Michelle, of. Can I make the last point? Yes. And that is uh, to Salim Valley. Uh, I agree. So, so psychosocial barriers uh, are neglected. Um, I um, actually want to mention um, uh, Crane Sodin's edited book, um, which was published uh, last year, no, the year before last. Uh, in his book, uh, or their book, they also mention, um, mm. in fact, what they do is they highlight the importance the, the importance of psychosocial barriers uh, and psychosocial factors. And I yeah. think that going forward, um, uh, you know, I, I encourage people uh, and encourage myself also to keep a focus on those kinds of barriers. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And thank you, Zelda, for those suggestions on further research. I think there were six of them, and we'll bear that in mind as we move forward. So some very interesting uh, information from Zelda and some really insightful and honest uh, comments and uh, things for her to be as my in mind as well as we move forward. Colleagues, I'm going to make a judgment call. We at we, it's um, 11.30 now, we are running 10 minutes behind. I'm going to ask that Professor Hugo takes the first slot in session two, that we break for 10 minutes now, so that we're back at 11.40 as per the program. But also to ask you to, if you can, to grab, grab a, a quick cup of tea or coffee or water and then come back because in the next 10 minutes Professor Hugo is going to flight some videos that he has developed on different kinds of pedagogy and I think that that is going to be very interesting not just for ACET or TVET but also for education generally and um, Wayne's done amazing work with the TVET project that he's uh, running um, and I'm hoping that you will also benefit from
from the videos that he has really taken time to do and he's very passionate about as well. So, Wayne, if uh, we can start with that and then we go for break and we're back at 11.40. Um, th that's you, more than fine. That'll be great. Um, I'm assuming the video, yeah, the videos are probably going to come up, but whilst they're coming up, um, this is really about community education. So it's an attempt to go deep into the history of what community education looks like uh, from a Southern African view. So I'm really passionate about doing this in a way where we celebrate our community, uh, but just watch it and then we'll come back afterwards. Uh, the sound's not working just in case. Uh, Sean, if you can click the sound on it. Sean, the sound's definitely not working. Whilst it's not working, I'm assuming everyone can't hear it. What I'm trying to do is I'm taking you through to the border cave, which is actually between Swaziland in front of you and northern KwaZulu-Natal behind you. And this is a cave that's had continuous occupation of us as Southern African human beings. Uh, and what I'd like to try and explore in this video is to try and show you all the ways that we've learned and the things that we've made over the last 200,000 years. So we don't think about this as a situation where somehow 1652 some white oaks arrived. There's a far longer history of this. That example you can see is actually a bone which actually contains a whole bunch of mathematical counting slots from like a hundred thousand years ago. And the idea in these videos is what I want to try and do is try set up community education by taking a deep backward history at it to try and understand how we did it not just as our modern human beings, but as we evolve to become who we are. And of course, that story doesn't only occupy a situation in Southern Africa, it's actually an African story because that's where we came from. That's as human beings where we came from. And that's the central uh, part of the story that I want to tell. But in terms of this particular side of it, um, I chose Border Cave because it's got an absolutely astonishing research history behind it. So what I'm doing over here is I'm flying back into it. Uh, sorry that it's kind of hesitating a bit over there. The actual quality of the video isn't working well here. And what I've done is I've inserted uh, the actual footage now of Border Cave itself. And there's a, a team at um, Wits University under Lynn Wadley. And what's happening is they basically started to do the painstaking research involved to try and understand the 200,000 year history. And they've been responsible for starting to unpack all the kinds of ways we went out and hunted with our boys, how we went and gathered uh, food, uh, tubers with our girls, um, how we uh, lived in these kinds of caves. Uh, there's beautiful evidence of straw mattresses uh, where uh, we actually, not straw, grass mattresses, we made comfortable places to actually live in these times, fires with lots of evidence of all the food we ate. And the basic idea behind trying to do this is trying to say, from a very early stage, hundreds of thousands of years ago, we were teaching each other how to actually live and work in this beautiful country of ours. And in this particular example, this is a thing called euphorbia, which they were using, uh, the Bushmen were using as a, as a way of not only a, a medicine, it was great as a medicine, but it was also a hectic poison. I actually got stabbed by it once and it really hurt me. Uh, I had to take antibiotics. And it's also used as a binding agent. They use it with um, wax, honey wax, to haft uh, 
uh, arrowheads onto wooden um, sticks for, for the arrows that they're making it. And how the hell did these guys learn that? You know, they weren't in lectures, <laughs> kind of like what I'm giving now with some kind of expert. These were people living together um, and learning together where someone who would have picked up some of the skills as a youngster by just hanging out with each other, watching what other people are doing, and slowly but surely picking up those skills in very early forms of community pedagogy and enabling uh, this process to actually happen. And this is actual footage of uh, some of the things which were made uh, 100,000 years ago. So this is the evidence that they've uncovered. And I find it absolutely astonishing when I see that kind of stuff. So what I've then tried to do is I've gone right back into the difference between how actually learning is a core ingredient of us becoming human. So that's the idea behind it is we go deeply back into our history. And this is the idea where you do have an expert who's learned how to make an error. And then you have another person who's watching it. But there's this weird thing. If you work with like monkeys or chimps or something like that, you can't get them to focus on a thing in front of you. This ability to have a joint goal, which we both understand, and joint attention, where we're working from different perspectives, but working on something together. That's a core part of what made us human. And it's also a core part, actually, of what education is. That's what a teacher does. You have a teacher and a learner, and they both have a role. They're paying attention to something. They have a joint goal. And even though they're working from different perspectives, they're trying to grapple with what it is to learn. And if we don't get that right as human beings, we can't survive because we're actually thin, naked, uh, weak creatures who are using our cultural learning to survive. And there's all sorts of fascinating examples of how we did this. This is actual footage of uh, the bedding, which was used from around about 100,000 years ago, found in this cave. And, and this bedding was taken from grasses. It was mixed with all sorts of other ingredients. Uh, but specifically, the point I wanted to make over here is at a certain point, they burn all the grass in the cave. And you can see the ash that's over there. Now, how, you can imagine if you're a kid, and all of a sudden, your adults around you, this is 200,000 years ago, decide to burn the very place that you're living with them and the enormous danger that's involved there. And to do that, to get rid of the vermin. And that could only happen if, as a community, you understood what the goal was, you all worked in it together, and you all had different tasks within it. And through that process, you actually landed up protecting your bedding from ticks, which is what it did. You actually would uh, burn, burn, burn the stuff and get rid of all the vermin-like ticks. And then they'd use all sorts of extra things like camphor um, tree leaves, for example, to uh, make the, the bed smell really nice on the one side, but it also protected the beds from, uh, <laughs> from all sorts of little unwanted creatures. Now, this is 200,000 years ago, okay? Uh, it just blows my mind that if we've got to think about the way the community pedagogy works, we, we've got to go this far back. And this is the story that's told uh, in this absolutely beautiful cave where this is the sunset over the cave overlooking Eswatini or the old Swaziland where you can see the, the, sugar, um, the sugar fields and all the sorts of farming that's going on there. Uh, and to say that it's just become a, a passion of mine to try and do the story of community education by reconstructing how we think about it from the baseline and being proud of the heritage we have in this country of doing it. And finally, just to say thanks, obviously, to the uh, TLDC PIP program, uh, the DHET, and then the European Union for doing that. And if you want, there's a whole bunch of other videos you can watch on this which I've tried to construct and I'm still working on, but we're coming back to um, past tea time. And <laughs> I wasn't expecting to do the talk over here, but if you did happen to hang in for this, that's cool. Uh, otherwise, I hope you had a good cup of tea. <laughs>
Thank you so much for, for that, Wayne. Um, despite the hitch, you always rise to the occasion and um, the wonderful way in which you present and speak to us as well uh, encourages interest. I'm certainly going to follow up on that. I didn't know fire could make me a teacher or a learner, but um, I understand <laughs> the conceptualization of that work. So thanks very much for that. Um, colleagues, it's 11.39. We back from our break and I'm passing over the uh, responsibility of cheering to my colleague, Dr. Morgan Maputa, who will start um, with the Wayne session, his panel session um, with Vanessa uh, around the workplace uh, um, learning and whether we are ready for that. So thank you everyone for your participation. Morgan, you're going to have to unmute. Thank you so much, Michelle, for taking us through uh, session one. Let me check with you if you were ready to introduce uh, the panel, since this was an activity for session one. Can do that as he facilitates the, the session, the actual activity. Yes, Vanessa and Mahato and Profugo. Hi, good morning, everybody. I think it's still morning. <laughs> hey, Vanessa, good to see you. Um, yes. Moses, good to see you good as well. Good morning, Rain and Vanessa. Yes. Um, good morning. So we we a little bit pushed for time. So I'm just going to introduce you guys quickly, yeah, set the screen, going. and then your expertise on this huge problem will be much welcome. So we have uh, Prof Moses Machato from the China University of Technology, and we have Vanessa Taylor, who's currently an independent consultant. I can strongly recommend her services if any of you would be interested. She does superb work, and as a as a community, we've been working uh, for a couple of years on this key issue of how do we work with workplace learning, but in a community college setup, were you doing informal learning, formal learning, uh, non-formal learning, all sorts of programs going here, there, and everywhere, and on top of it, it's completely underfunded as we work, we do this thing called work um, as learning. So we all put our heads to it, but the two people that really thought about it the most, I would have to say, was firstly Vanessa and Andre, um, God bless him, and uh, and Prof Mukhato. So Vanessa, why don't you start uh, okay. with setting the scene, and then um, Moses can go afterwards. Right. I have a um, a presentation, and hopefully will will be all fine. Can you all see that? Uh, yes, I can see it, Vanessa. Okay, all right. Okay, well, I'm going to try and go a bit faster. Um, but so what I thought I would do is just quickly contextualize this, um, just so we're all on the same page. We're looking at workplace will within the ASET qualifications, and specifically our focus is on what the qualification actually refers to as industry-based settings. There are two types of will. So we're focusing more on the workplace-based setting for will rather than on the the classroom-based setting. And in the qualification, it actually uses a good industry-based example, factory work sites and offices, which became a problem for us. Um, but then also the term specialized workplace is used with two of those qualifications. Um, so when we developed this, just, just to give you a little bit of background here, I, as I, it's been introduced, I worked with Andre van der Bale, um, and again, I just want to pay tribute to him because he made a huge contribution here and in TVET in general, as well as ASET. Um, but we worked for a couple of years on developing a curriculum framework for the will component, the, the workplace-based will component in the ASET qualifications. Um, and it wasn't easy. There was a lot of contestation and good debate. So we had we had a lot of participation. And so what came out wasn't just coming from Andre and myself, um, 
but it was certainly the group and some of the issues that came out and I mean it partly goes back to some of the things that Salim Vali was saying this morning is the relevance of sending uh, ASEC lecturers and educators into workplaces so it, it, this whole notion of placement comes from TVET and and as Wayne said earlier ASEC is so different community education is so different so is it applicable um, and, and what are the aims of this in the ASET context, as well as the sites, the big, big issue that we de debated and discussed and went round in circles on. And, and in a way, I think it's still unresolved. And I, I would like to say this is an area that, that we need to actually do research on once these qualifications start being implemented. We really need to understand what are the appropriate sites for placement of uh, ASET students. And there was debate around the suitability of business or industry. We all hated the word industry. It didn't seem applicable in an ASET context um, versus community sites and organizations. So that kind of came up. There was also a lot of discussion around this in formal programs versus formal programs. So just let's look at some of the issues. To summarize, when we're looking at this in, in ASET, when we're looking at will and the qualifications, the big thing is what is the purpose? And how relevant is it? And I think that since it's in the qualifications and it's a requirement, our challenge is to find a way to make this applicable and relevant. And I believe that it, it can be. Um, then there's a question about which students we're going to place. So is it applicable to all students? Because we have a lot that are teaching maths, or science, or, or maybe languages. Or is it only for vocational subjects? And again, this is something that each university will need to resolve. The issue of the suitable sites, as I said. And then another issue that's particularly pertinent in the community education context is the formality of the organization or that site. If we're looking at community context, we're moving towards more informal, but this has implications for the management of that placement arrangement because universities are required to do this in a structured formal way and enter into proper agreements, manage that learning and make sure that it do. So that's a big issue in this context. Looking at the purpose of this, what did we come up with in our curriculum framework for this? And I'm going to just tie it back into what the qualification was saying. So we felt that there were really two purposes. If you're sending a person into a workplace, you're developing knowledge and skills in relation to practice in their subject field. So it's how that subject actually applies in the context of doing something. And it doesn't have to just be formal work. It could be development. It could be community-based. So it's in, a con in the context of some kind of activity and work in relation to the subject that you teach. Um, and then the second um, point here was that we wanted the educators to be able to contextualize the subject that they teach to the real practices that take place and 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 what is required in terms of that subject so they can they can better prepare their their students so whether it's for social or community development ac activities or for actual work this particular element in the qualification can contribute to 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 that educator being able to make this sort of link to that and, and make it more relevant. Quickly then, how does it actually tie into the qualification? Because I'm trying to answer the question is, is there a, is there a place for this? Um, there are 22 competencies that we want to develop when we develop ACET educators. The first one has, well, I've actually picked out three. So the third one, number three, relates to our educators actually understanding the context of their learners, where these learners come from, what their aspirations, what their career and study pathways are and opportunities. So, so it, it, it provides more information and, 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 and um, knowledge for, for the educator in terms of that. Another um, competency is understand ways of thinking and applications involved in a particular subject and how this may be taught. So again, we'd argue that that placement within a sort of community or work context that allows you to look at how your subject is practiced would, would, would um, enhance this understanding the field or subject. 
So developing more knowledge of your subject and also how you bring that back into your teaching and integrate it with all other knowledges. And then finally, being able to respond to current social and economic uh, and education pro problems. So depending on where you're placing your student, whether it's in, an, in a kind of social or, or community context versus a, a, a workplace, there is a lot that, that that student can learn that relates to their particular subject. Then the question of which students, should we be providing this for all of our students or just those that, that do vocational subjects? The national and international practice and literature on this is focused on vocational educators, but nevertheless, the literature also shows that there is a lot of value and it happens that school teachers and teachers of non-vocational subjects like mathematics do these kinds of work ex experiences and that they do find it, it valuable. And so when you're looking at this for ACET, and again, each university is really looking at how they're going to offer this, um, there are benefits for sending both vocational and non-vocational uh, educators for this type of will. So those who are vocational, they will fo focus more on the organizational and work as activities that relate to the, the practical application on their subject. Um, and in the non-vocational, if you look at English and mathematics, those lecturers or, or educators can look at how this works, how English or mathematics is used in, in the implementation of different work activities and organizational activities. So there are, there are benefits both ways, although I found in my experience with TVET lecturers that the vocational lecturers definitely find it more valuable. And there can be questions about you know, English and mathematics lecturers and, and how what they what they learn when they go out, what how to focus their learning. So again, that's open to people to consider as they implement. It's one of the issues. So who are the organizations that are suitable? I used to work for an organization called SACI, Swiss South African Cooperation Initiative, and was involved in the placement of students and TVET lecturers for, for about 12 years. Saki defined a site for, for Will in quite a broad way because even within the TVIT space, um, they're not always sufficient sort of formal workplaces. And depending on the subject, you could learn in various contexts. So it could be formal businesses. It could be um, more, there was the, the issue of the sort of open air business location and more non uh, formal type situations, but but questions around that too, in terms of the management. But it was quite open in, in the way we defined that. Um, in our uh, will framework, we we had a number of possible sites for will. The one would be a set of business or industrial workplace. It doesn't need to be a big factory. It could be a much smaller business. It could be a business that's actually in the community or in a near, nearby by town. A government, non-government, faith-based organization that services or is based in a community um, or in a, near, a town that's near that community. And, and lastly, and this is what I'm going to talk about a bit more, it was one of the ideas that came through our workshops on this, and that was um, using a community education training college as an anchor host for this. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on that concept just now. But I think that the common feature between all of these is that some kind of work or activity would take place at that site that relates to the subject specialization of that student that's been placed there. That's the important thing when you're selecting that site. Um, I'm just gonna look a little bit about the issue of informality, where the problem is that the more informal, so if you've got open air businesses, people who are repairing exhausts on the side of the road, it can become difficult to enter into some arrangement with that uh, employer or that that person to, in, in providing the experience as well as whether they can provide actually the full range that's required. So, so an argument that came in our development was the possibility of our, our, our community colleges actually providing, being an anchor host so that the, 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 the students get placed with them for the workplace 
will, as well as the teaching practice, but that for the workplace will, they would be through that community organization, basically making arrangements through their network to access uh, sites for will for the workplace will the university would need would be able to enter into a placement arrangement with the community college which would make that easier um, but obviously there would need to be a very close relationship just to make sure that that actually happens as it should and obviously it's not viable until we have fully functional ce2s C cetcs that can manage this this kind of arrangement and actually have these networks that we could tap into. So for now, I think that this is not really an option on the table and you're looking at more having to find those places yourself. Just a few lessons I'm going to look at for will implementation, and then I'm going to quickly just move on to some of the things that you'd need to do to place um, people, some of the implementation. So again, from SACI, you need, for this to succeed, you need good planning and preparation. There have to be benefits. If you're going to place people in organizations, they need to be seeing how it's also going to benefit them. Very important, you have to have a good match between the work of that host and organization and the activities as well as the student themselves. And while the institution has overall responsibility, it's really important that students see themselves as, as ultimately being responsible for making this um, su successful and valuable for themselves. In terms of service learning, we can learn from them as well. And I think that what service learning shows is that you need to bring build strong partnerships for this to see succeed. Um, you've got to prepare your students very well uh, for this. And especially if you're placing them in communities, how to behave and, and how to conduct themselves. Safety is always a big issue within communities. And it's even in companies where there's possibility of injuries through, through machinery and so on. But we need to look at those kinds of things. My last slide is just going to be looking at some of the implementation issues when you're implementation, implementing this. So firstly, you need to be clear about the roles and responsibilities that um, sit between the different parties. There's the university, there's the host organization and the student. We have in our will implementation um, in our in our curriculum framework that we developed, we've fleshed out the roles and responsibilities. And also, there was a will implementation guide that was developed by myself and Andre, which goes into this implementation in a lot more detail. So that's available through um, the CLEP project. So and again, thanks to, thanks for, for for sponsoring this. So these issues are addressed there. But in terms of implementation. One of the big challenges, and I'm sure when Prof. Mukhali gets onto this, he's going to talk about some of these things. You have to be able to identify sites that will take your students. And it's not just saying, well, we want this particular place. You have to recruit them. You have to bring them on board. You have to get them willing to do it. Then you have to prepare the organizations that will be hosting your students. They need to know what this is about, what's expected of them, how it's going to work, as well as formalizing these arrangements with them because it's clear to me from my dealing with the university these needs to be formalized preparation of the students where the students go into communities or in business it's essential that they know how to conduct themselves and and what what is required of them what learning is required um, before they go in there's a whole lot of arrangements that need to be managed how how this thing is how people will get there transport um you know in some cases there's personal protective equipment if you've got engineering students so all of these things need to be organized beforehand and then when those students are in the workplace they need to be managed and it, it obviously happens by the workplace but also the university would need to make sure that that everything is going according to plan and then then lastly but incredibly importantly if you're going to make this succeed you need to be building a set of relationships with whichever organizations you're bringing on board to do this. Um, all of these act activities that I have mentioned here within the university and the faculty of education implementing this, you're going to have to make decisions about who's going to bring those host employers in, who's responsible, where will the students get their preparation for this, who's going to visit those organizations, who's going to manage students in the workplace, who's going to make sure those relationships are developed and 
that your partnerships are become strong and sustainable. So that is all for me. I'm going to hand over uh, to Prof Mukhaile to talk to us about his experience so far of actually trying to implement this and the challenges and issues they're facing. So that's the end for me. I think I've stopped sharing. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Vanessa and uh, Wayne. Colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, uh, just to correct, uh, Vanessa is Moses Mahatu. Oh, sorry. Is now. now. I, I, I don't know. I just want to share my slide. Uh, share the screen before I come in there. Um, sh screen sharing is just too much. Uh, yeah, I'm just, just sharing my screen. Sean, can you assist me with my slides? Can you see my slides? At the moment, we can't, um, Moses. Uh, but, um, Sean, Sean can, you, can you project it, please? Uh, the one that I sent you earlier. I, I don't know why it doesn't appear. It looks like it's up. Um, Moses, workplace learning in the yeah, advanced. Thank you. It's coming. Yeah. Yes, it's uh, share. So Moses, all you need right, to do thank is- Thank you very much uh, once again. Um, my pre presentation is based on the program Advanced Diploma Asset that we developed at the university. And uh, particularly it will, run, it will run straight to the, the work-based, workplace-based learning. But before that, I just want to give some background on the qualification and and that is to take it from what uh, Dr. Maputa sometimes mentioned, that this was informed by the policy that uh, was probably mailgated in 2015, which is the policy on minimum requirements for program leading to qualifications for educators and lecturers in adult and community education and training. Yes, uh, once more, uh, the presentation outline is on the background and also on college-based will and industry-based will. Uh, I will start with the, the background. On the background, I just want to reiterate that uh, this advanced diploma asset was informed by the policy, which you see there, and the teaching and learning that is associated with that is that of where the educators has to acquire integrate and apply the knowledge for teaching and learning when they are at the colleges, which is called SCET colleges, the former ABET uh, colleges. And this was module, the modules and the subject that were formulated were based on the policy which stipulated that they should be disciplinary learning, pedagogical learning, practical work integrated learning, which will go straight to how we have operationalized it within this program, situational learning and fundamental learning. Um, the next slide. Uh, further, the background to this is that the CET colleges or community education training colleges and the educators and lecturers that are there should be able to teach and ba basically mostly at the basic vocational skills and knowledges within those colleges, CET, and commonly scattered all over the country, the CLC's curriculum program, which are consisting of formal and informal programs that are already, and mostly as this program has taken into consideration 
the formal and informal programs that are, are in there at the colleges. And further, the educators and lecturers who teach these popular subjects within this informal category, which I've mentioned here, informal category, which uh, are vocational, uh, refers to automotive repair and maintenance, small scale manufacture, and many other vocational skills that are in this program that we develop. That they should be competent in both theoretical and practical components of the courses that they will be teaching, which involve the informal and the formal, mostly informal, the vocational. And a strong workplace learning component is built into the asset qualification to capacitate educators and lecturers in order to prepare the learners for the demands of workplace. Um, so improving the relationship between education and workplaces industries, and in this case, industries, as uh, Vanessa said, refers to also community centers and other informal centers. Uh, and this become a very priority in this program. And the CITAS, here I just want to raise also some challenges that uh, as we were developing this program, we have come across because we have developed this program as it was mentioned by involving the CITAS also as well as the community education and training colleges. And we found that there's a very great challenge regarding the partnership between the CETs and the workplace based learning, as well as the UOTs or University of Technology or any universities. So now how are we gonna address this thing? I found that, uh, or I, I see that the CITAS should play a very key role in assisting because they are very close to industries. Otherwise, we will not be able to actually implement this aspect of a work-based place learning very, very effectively. The partnership of education and workplaces, as we know in the P -set, white paper P set, recognizes the importance of work-based learning in achieving the goals of the P set of, or the post-school education and training system. The purpose of TVET, ladies and gentlemen, is to prepare students for the work, the world of work, which is actually an international practice as we know, and on that, I will just want to say that uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, programs or intervention by the DHET, which actually start to adopt the, the dual system, which is a very good thing. But in terms of the challenges regarding the infrastructure and the poor partnership between the, 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 the colleges and the workplaces, this is going to be a problem. And further, the vocational curriculum at CET College should continuously change as the workplace demand change. And that means that uh, educators and lecturers should know that by going to industry and workplaces, they should observe the changes there that are mostly related to the four IR as was alluded to. And once more, there's a very quiet challenges as we know regarding the divide, the digital divide regarding the four IR. But that's very crucial that uh, as the colleges, lecturers and the educators visit this industry or community centers, they should understand and learn the skills of the four IR, which by now we are, I will say, a little bit far from that based on the infrastructure that is not there. One, one presenter actually mentioned that this sector is actually, or these colleges are really, really under-resourced and they are quite behind, according to me, and there is a much transformation that has to be happened if this qualification has to make a very huge difference. That's what I want to say. Furthermore, I just want to present the next slides. The, in the program, what we have done to operationalize the college-based will and the industry-based will so that we can achieve the goals of the white paper, PSET, and all other documents that uh, relate to the uh, proper effective learning in terms of acquisition of vocational skills by uh, giving these learners or lecturers or educators to the industry or to the workplaces, because that's the only place where they can learn and become com competent vocationally and be able to produce competent youth that will be able to be absorbed by the different kind of workplaces, which by now I will say we're still a little bit behind regarding that aspect. Now, in this advanced diploma asset, we have arranged 
the workplace-based learning in this way. As it is important, this program is a two-year program, is a year one and year two, and in year one they will be doing some modules or subjects which will include the college will. As you can see in this slide, we have a first year, year one college will, which will be four weeks. And as Vanessa says, this college based will will involve also informal sectors or community centers, which indeed Vanessa will have to really, which hasn't been done now, because as I speak right now, we are busy trying to open the program for the 2021. So we'll have to really do a very big arrangement and planning for the students to be there. But this requires a very strong partnership. If that doesn't exist, we're gonna uh, experience a huge problem, which I say that currently, as we've been going to these colleges, we have really re realized that everybody is still wanting to work in silo. So this aspect, uh, colleagues and the DHEAD, we would like all of us to join hands in order to strengthen the partnership, in order that this will aspect should be uh, realized. So it will be a four weeks in the first year where they will be going to college or mostly college, in fact, where they will be teaching and uh, start to learn the work-based learning, uh, vocational pedagogy. In this case, the most focused aspect in this part of the year, it will be the vocational pedagogy where they will learn how to teach their informal or vocational subjects or the formal subjects, as you mentioned, mathematics, English, and so on. So that's the key aspect in this one. So in the second year, in the next slides, you will see that we've got two types of will, but in the, year, the first, the second year, we have got one will, which is college-based learning will, which is B, the previous year, it was A. So they will continue with the college-based will, B, and there, again, they'll be going to four, four weeks, at the college or the place where they will be teaching. Mostly here, it will be the CLC where they will be teaching and they will learn how to teach. So once again, colleagues here, we have got a bit of challenge. When you go to the CLC, you'll find that they come there afternoon at two o'clock at uh, uh, schools. Currently, I'd, I haven't seen perhaps, we'll get in the next presentation, how the structured uh, CET at this case or CLC will be. But currently, some, to me, I found when I go around, there are still CLC which comes at two o'clock and they don't have uh, infrastructure and so on. But, but I leave it to those who are in charge to tell us what are the developments so far regarding uh, CLC where they will be teaching at the, in this Will College. Now, the last one, which is the another Will or work -based, workplace based learning at a, a, a industry, it will be industry-based learning will. This one, ladies and gentlemen, I must say that is the first time we engage in this one. And as you said, Vanessa, it's gonna be quite a challenge and it's really also a challenge, but uh, I must say we have learned a little bit of a lesson because we've got advanced diplomativity for colleges that uh, currently they're at the coll colleges, not at the industry, but there also they will be getting into their industry. So here we call upon, in this case, that uh, we, request that CITAS or all the relevant stakeholders assist us to get more placement or industry, whether it's a community centers where we will be actually placing these teachers or lecturers at the CLC or CET centers in order to be able to uh, learn the skills. In fact, in this case, as I said, because it will be industry-based will, where they will be learning, although as I have to mention, this is an advanced diploma asset. It is no, not too much a skills-based learning or vocational skills-based learning. As a result, it will be more of exposure where they learn by being exposed to some of the skills, whether welding or plumbing, et cetera, et cetera, under the informal subjects, which are vocational in most cases. So we will be really required to place them in the industry where they will be learning some skills. And the assumption which is wrong is to say that uh, these people come with the experience of vocational skills. It's not true in this case, but uh, they still need reskilling in terms of uh, the vocational skills, competence or practical skills 
in this case. But the assumption in this program is that they come having some 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 vocational skills, which is not a, a, an issue here in this case. But in any way, they will be learning some vocational skills or inform, informal aspect of their qualification at this industry. Uh, I think with this, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my uh, presentation regarding the asset program that we developed and the the will industry and the will college that the students will be placed uh, in, in their period of two years when they will be in this advanced diploma asset. Thank you very much, Wayne and, uh, and colleagues. Thanks, thanks, Moses, and thanks, Vanessa. Uh, so as you can hear, this is a huge, huge, huge area of uh, contention and problems logistically, philosophically, all over the show, which we've made a really good attempt to try and solve. But you can hear that, number one, why are we talking about vocational skills so much when we're in a community college, for example? So there's been a huge tension in how this thing is thought through from a TVET side to a community college side. So we've had to try and finesse that because community colleges do do lots of vocational programs. That's number one. Number two, you've just heard that the community colleges don't have many links with industry, NGOs, churches, all that kind of <laughs> stuff. But nor, nor do the universities. They are vitals. So you're sitting with two institutions, neither of which know who they're going to contact for the work-based learning site. So it creates huge problems in terms of that. And, and Moses, to say the solution of starting to say, we have to start to link with the CETAs. We have to start to link with other organizations which are already doing this work. I think it's got to a situation where sometimes when you're forced into the situation as a, a university, it's one of the best things that can happen to you because you suddenly start to have to open out to the links to the community. So very interesting to hear the solutions. And I just have to say congratulations because a couple of years ago when we started asking this question, it was a really difficult question to grapple with. And to hear the clarity and the way that you guys have moved forward uh, is superb. Um, I, don't, I think we've actually run out of time here in terms of the fact that we've pushed it forward. Um, and uh, I don't see, we don't see uh, any comments coming through from where I am. So I'm assuming we can hand over now to either Morgan or Michelle, uh, or we can take further discussion if anyone would like to, to ask questions. I think this was the end of activities for session one we are now moving forward to session two and i hope the presenters for session two are ready but before we start with the presentations for session two let me take this opportunity to thank all the presenters for session one and say your ideas your views your inputs are noted as we move the agenda for ASAT lecturer professionalization forward. For now, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be introducing to you Mr. David Diale. Mr. David Diale is the chief director for education, I mean, for the chief director for education, training, development, and assessment in the community education and training. Uh, branch of the Department of Higher Education and Training. Mr. Diale will be taking us through the topic, teaching in a COVID-19 context, challenges for CET lecturers. Mr. Diale, over to you, sir. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Maputa. Uh, good, uh, good day to everyone. Uh, I've uh, shared a presentation with uh, Sean. Can Sean actually assist?
Thanks, thanks, Sean. Colleagues, uh, I hear that uh, I'm supposed to respond to some issues. Uh, unfortunately, the topic that I was given is quite uh, clear in terms of uh, what, what I'm supposed to do. So <clears throat> nonetheless, at the end of it, I'll, I'll respond to, to some of the, the issues raised. Uh, can we then move with the slide? Colleagues, the first issue, of course, is that, uh, you know, uh, this is a point made earlier uh, around um, <clears throat> the context of implementation, uh, which is a context that uh, is characterized by a number of uh, very problematic uh, conditions. COVID itself, a deepening economic crisis here in the country, but also globally. Of course, how are families and households and communities surviving the multiple crises of uh, social economic uh, sustainability? And then of course, issues of, of climate change. Um, in relation to the white paper, the key point made by the white paper, of course, is that um, we must train and retrain uh, lecturers in particular methodologies appropriate for teaching adults and youth. Um, now, from the engagement initial with uh, Prof. Salim Vali, is this then characterizing a deficit model or not of, of, of lecturer development? Is an issue that, that, that we just uh, note. Um, thirdly, of course, the introduction of CET colleges is as a result of a history and legacy of trying to improve on the adult education and training system. Um, Next slide, please. Now the CET vision is really around how we open up the system to ensure diverse program, accessible programs uh, for individuals and, and communities. Um, and this is contained in our CET sector plan. Um, now I, I I note in the in the in the comments about fantasies. Um, I, I suppose uh, John might say this is another fantasy, uh, but one must say, um, you know, in this platform, in on a lighter note, in this platform, there are many of those who have contributed to the fantasy from 1994 with the 15 million target of trying to address adult education then. So we've had our, our fantasies all, all along. Nonetheless, the point is that uh, um, the issue that has been raised, I think, around whether there's political will is, is an important issue because if indeed political will is there, uh, the one million target is actually achievable. Um, I think one of the things that, of course, we did not do as a country um, is uh, because this is National Planning Commission target. So when the commissioners presented this report to the nation, um, uh, there was insufficient engagement around the costing of the of the of the presentation of the the, the plan itself. Um, so so it's one aspect that of course uh, continues to then bedevil the PSA system. Next slide. This is just to show the impact of the um, the virus in relation to to to. Um, uh, participation in 2020. Uh, in the first uh, quarter of 2020, um, we had 180,000 students uh, who had registered and were starting to attend um, uh, uh, our, our centers, how them providing the largest enrollment. Uh, um, next slide, please. Just in terms of the qualifications themselves, uh, the two qualifications, the GETC ABET had around 80,000 uh, students and then the senior certificate had around 
25,000 students and then the national senior certificate around 25,000 students and the senior certificate 30,000 students. So still heavily um, loaded towards academic uh, qualifications. So next, next slide. This is just the gender distribution in terms of that cohort of the 80, 000, uh, 180,000 students. Um, female students constituting 71.5% of, of students in, in the sector, um, which has been the, the norm anyway. And then male students constituting 53%. Of course, we've been engaging with this aspect of uh, how do we ensure we attract males? And then, of course, one of the factors is, of course, um, the nature of, of, of programs. Next slide. Now, if you note that we, we had 80,000 students for the GETC, but when it came to writing the exam at the end of the year, we only had 41,689 uh, uh, candidates writing the November 2020 uh, examinations. So almost a 50% um, dropout in terms of the, 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 the students writing the, the exam. And, and part of it, to some extent, of course, is, is COVID related. But when we looked at the 2019 November stats, uh, the number is not uh, that high. So there's a general trend, of course, of, of, of uh, dropouts that we need to address even uh, pre the, the pandemic. Next slide. How we have responded to the pandemic and what has been the impact of the, the pandemic? Um, uh, the pandemic indeed had a huge uh, uh, impact on, on the provision in the sector, with us losing 91 days of tuition in terms of our approved academic uh, calendar. Uh, there were major risks with regards to June examinations, which we had to then postpone. The GTC ABET in June was postponed. The senior certificate in 2020, June 2020 was also uh, um, um, postponed. A recovery plan was developed as an attempt to deal with, uh, you know, saving lives, but also trying to save the academic year. Uh, the plan was premised on a number of uh, 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 interventions. Um, of course, dealing with the June exams, uh, uh, trying to deal with the increase of the number of hours once the lockdown eased. We provided additional learning and teaching support materials as well as, as, well as curriculum support uh, documents. Um, uh, we distributed also lecturer support documents. Um, uh, and then of course, um, once the, the lockdown eased, there were a number of interventions around uh, exam preparations. And then of course, in terms of health support, there was support through higher health, uh, whether it's a, a psychosocial support in terms of um, how people were actually feeling in relation to, to the pandemic. Uh, so higher health tried to assist us in relation to that, including all of the compliance related issues in terms of the pandemic. Um, so to some extent, the 2020 academic year was, was saved. Uh, um, um, however, you know, the impact was, was, was actually uh, uh, huge. Next slide. For example, these were some of the effects of the pandemic. Um, even with regard to the recovery plan, we didn't have sufficient time to implement it. Um, the second big point, of course, which people have raised throughout the, the earlier presentation, uh, we didn't have any other alternative mechanisms for teaching and learning. So we had to wait for the lockdowns to be eased. Um, and then, of course, uh, we then had to 
deal with uh, reprioritizing the inadequate, inadequate resources to ensure that we comply with the COVID-19 uh, regulations. So that was a second major effect. The third one was, of course, that those lecturers with comorbidities had to stay at home, which meant that you couldn't provide uh, substitute uh, staff when the lockdown was, was, was eased. The other issue in terms of the effect was that access to school infrastructure uh, became problematic because directives on provinces barred any other stakeholder outside of the education to access schools. So your churches were using schools, ourselves were using schools. There were challenges then in terms of accessing school infrastructure. Uh, the big impact, of course, was also for both uh, our students and lecturers was the fear itself of the pandemic. Whilst higher health was, was there, but uh, it came slightly late in terms of adequate cons cons counseling and support for lecturers and students. And, and therefore that is reflected, as I've argued, in relation to also your examination and statistics. Uh, we're still analyzing the examinations results themselves because that will also give us a, a, a better sense of what indeed was the major, major, the major impact. Uh, next, next slide. Now, in relation to programs and the fact that the advanced diplomas that are being developed are being developed to respond to these three categories of programs that the CET colleges are mandated to provide. Your non-formal programs, your formal occupational or skills programs and qualifications, and then of course your formal general education qualifications. So the engagement in relation to what the Tswani University has, uh, University of Technology has just presented, uh, it would indeed be uh, good for us to engage outside of this platform uh, because there is indeed a need for uh, interventions around your skills programs and formal uh, qualifications. So I would welcome an engagement with yourselves uh, in relation to this aspect. Um, in relation to non-formal, of course, we are engaging with uh, colleagues like DVV and trying to uh, engage in this space, expand this space, um, deal with all of the other obstacles around uh, the insufficient recognition of non-formal programs as critical programs for, uh, for, for, for delivery in community colleges. Next slide. Now, our lecture cohort, um, the, we had a system performance report of 2017, uh, uh, which, which indicated all of the issues around who our lecturers are. Firstly, of course, that uh, there are lecturers who are qualified in the system, and then there are others who, in terms of the current characterization of what constitutes qualification. Uh, for example, lecturers at RQV10 means they have a metric only, and then re, uh, lecturers at RQV11, they have a metric and one year of study, which may mean a certificate. Uh, lecturers at RQV12 may mean a metric plus two years of study, which may be the old uh, diplomas. And then of course, RQV13 is metric plus, plus three years, and a lot of the, uh, uh, lecturers are, are then qualified for that. And that's the current requirement for a person to be employed in, in CET uh, colleges. In addition to that, uh, one of the challenges, of course, that someone had indicated earlier around the generic nature of some of the lecturer qualifications before the introduction of the policy. Uh, you have lecturers who, of course, are qualified lecturers and are correctly placed in, in terms of them have, having subject specialization. Um, there are those who are qualified lecturers but are not properly placed. So partly they're not properly placed because the qualifications they have don't have any subject uh, specialization. And then of course the third category in terms of our 
current requirements is unqualified lecturer. So those who are, as I said earlier, matric plus one year, matric plus two year, or matric plus uh, three, uh, yeah, two years of study. The numbers um, have changed slightly, uh, but we haven't updated this, but, but the numbers would have uh, slightly changed. So at the moment, you're saying 38% of the lecturers uh, go back. Um, the pace of, of the lecturers in the system are still unqualified. Um, as I'm saying, a number of the lecturers have submitted to us um, uh, for upgrading of their qualifications, a proof of upgrading for their qualifications so that we adjust their RQVs. The one point that must be noted in terms of the broader critique that uh, is being uh, in, in, engaged in in this particular platform is that, of course, um, the point is that the characterization of the lecturer assess whether qualified or not um, does not adequately capture the skills and prior learning experiences of lecturers in the system. So it's merely reliant on, on a particular uh, qualification, which um, may, may, may be a limitation uh, of, the, of how we then deal with lack of uh, qualification. Next slide. Now, as a response to some of the issues related to the pandemic, there were a number of lecturer initiatives that some of them were done nationally, but a lot of them were actually uh, lecturers themselves in colleges and in centers. Uh, this is highlighted because the importance of how lecturer agency is a critical thing. How how you know uh, the space must be provided for lecturers to actually uh, take initiatives. And in this instance, for example, a number of the lecturers, despite that the fact that there was no infrastructure, but the use of gadgets like your cell phones um, to actually share information with students. So a number of the lecturers were doing that. Um, providing teaching and learning notes and activities to students via Google Classroom, Facebook, and WhatsApp. Um, I know that some of the lecturers had developed presentation, lesson presentations, and we're sharing them uh, through these, these, these social platforms. Um, and then, of course, there's zero rating of college websites and then accessibility to data actually enabled uh, the lecturers to do this thing. Some of the lecturers, of course, had collaboration with sister institutions, your TVETs, <clears throat> in some regions where lessons were being undertaken via radio. We also were engaging with the DB in terms of all of the uh, digital materials, which were then provided to students for the senior certificate examinations. Lecturers were also facilitating peer support and student support groups uh, in instances where lecturers were in the same neighborhood. Uh, students would then be sharing learning and teaching support materials, lessons, and, and some of the support uh, interventions, particularly uh, during the, the lockdown, before the lockdown was opened. And of, of course, when the lockdown was eased, um, we provided for additional time for lecturers to do work. Yeah, so weekends and school holidays were done as part of trying to <clears throat> uh, recover some time. And this indicated the kinds of intervention, the kinds of commitment that uh, the lecturers were actually demonstrating in, in trying to ensure that students are ready for examinations. Next slide. The next slide then is the current lecturer interventions in terms of trying to do a lot of uh, training. We've had support from the ETDP CETA to the tune of 10 million, uh, one for buzzeries, two for strengthening maths and science, and then also for training on skills programs. And of course, we have a DUT partnership in terms of uh, some of the CET College lecturers attending uh, the advanced uh, diploma teaching. We have the skills development levy in terms of the 1% of payroll, which also goes toward the 
training of, of, of lecturers. This is, is, is may usually for short-term training rather than, you know, uh, bazaars themselves. Uh, we've just entered into a partnership with MICCTA, so we'll be looking at ICT hardware provision as well as uh, uh, training on, on, on programs. Similarly, with the seed uh, partnership around issues of small business and entrepreneurship, there'll be training for our lecturers. With the WNR CETA project, the CETA has provided funding for us to establish ICT labs in our 54 pilot centers. Um, so these labs, uh, if ever the project goes well, should be up and running by the end of the academic academic year. We also then have a, a pilot project in the Eastern Cape uh, in a community learning center called Pofolo. Uh, this is a partnership with Science and Technology and the Technology Innovation Agency, where the project is, is attempting to use technology for the provision of digital skills, but also to look at whether there can be self-employment opportunities as a result of uh, skills provision. And then as I indicated, there are European Union projects. Uh, two of them, the one is on training on basic skills and uh, looking at the review of materials for blended learning. The other is support for the introduction of new qualifications. We're finalizing a policy on laptop provision for lecturers for both TVET and CET, which um, will then assist in terms of trying to get uh, digital devices to the lecturers themselves. And then lastly, the QCTO skills programs and training interventions we've developed. I think it's about uh, 14 skills programs now with the QCTO for implementation in CET colleges. So our engagement with Tswana University of Technology may be linked to this particular intervention where qualifications and programs are already on the CETA uh, system. We need to train our lecturers and then introduce such skills in, 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 in the colleges. Next slide. And the priority for 2021, uh, as I said, the policy on the provision of lecturers, uh, the, the provision of basic ICT training for lecturers in the pilot centers. Uh, we'll finalize the training on skills programs, the review of materials. We'll continue to provide bursaries for the advanced diploma. Um, and then of course, training for lecturers on assessment. Uh, part of the task this year is also looking at how the implementation of the APE open learning framework uh, gets adapted to suit the CET college uh, conditions. And then, of course, we have a number of partnerships that we, we are continuing to strengthen with DVEV, the Catholic Institute for Education, with a number of CETAs, uh, the Department of Correctional Services, Basic Education, and some of the universities. Next slide. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Let me just add one or two remarks in relation to some of the issues then raised. Um, the 2030 target colleagues indeed, uh, well, as a disciplined uh, bureaucrat, I can't say it's a fantasy, but the point made by John is an important point. Um, we also as departments have submitted um, remarks or comments to the department of uh, to DPME basically to look at the review of the targets. Uh, um, so that's the one aspect that we've done, but also within the department then there's a process around assessing what it will take for the 2030 targets to be to be to be uh, reached. Yeah. Um, I think, in terms of uh, some of the critical issues raised by uh, Professor Valley, um, so some of them, I think, because at the level that they are being engaged with, are much more uh, ideological, and I suppose at a different level because. The critique being made basically is around 
the thrust of government interventions. It's not only in education, but your economic policy, how, how, what assumptions underpin and inform that. Uh, um, so those are quite uh, critical issues, but I was interested in profiling then, you know, making the logical conclusion, then what? Uh, because these critiques must lead to some form of action um, um, uh, particularly for those outside of, 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 of government. Uh, but nonetheless, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Maputa. Um, the important thing I think to note is that uh, this is a, a useful platform for, for uh, uh, debating and engaging. And it's a platform that will enable us to take some of the issues forward, either via bilaterals, uh, and also to appreciate some of the information, uh, for example, um, uh, Professor Hruner's work, uh, where I would be interested in uh, its conclusions. I think the other thing, of course, is uh, Dr. Maputa sharing information with regards to some of the research outputs that have come out of the, um, the, the particular project. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, colleagues. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Diale. Uh, indeed, the training of lecturers at CET colleges is a high priority in the country so that they can be able to acquire relevant knowledge and skills uh, for teaching youth and adults. One other thing that I picked up from your presentation is the fact that COVID-19 has impacted negatively on the teaching and learning at community learning centers to such an extent that 50% of the students or the learners have actually dropped out and did not sit for the November 2020 exams. So a lesson for us as a country is that we are living in a COVID-19 environment and teaching and learning must go on. Therefore, how do we maneuver through this? Thank you so much, Mr. Diale. Without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, we are now moving to the next item on the program, which is a panel discussion. Dr. Lend and Professor Ismail will participate in this panel discussion, focusing mainly on the program development and initial implementation. They will share with us the experiences, the challenges and strategies of offering the new advanced diplomas under COVID-19. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, let me welcome Professor Ismail and Dr. Land. Michelle, do you have something to say? Um, yes, Morgan, I'm very sorry and I apologize to everyone, but I've just received a message from the Mail and Guardian who is hosting this that they have, they will, we will be cut off at one o'clock, which is the time that we said we will end. Um, so it looks as though it's going to be impossible to have Sandra's, uh, to have the next session, but I'm wondering if we could just spend five, two, three minutes with each of the students so that we can get a sense of the experiences and unfortunately will not be able to have the session that you have just welcomed because we will only have a few minutes for it and it won't really make sense. Okay. So my now proposal is, thank you so yeah, much. We only have 11 minutes left before the Mail and Guardian oh. um, link closes. Okay, thank you so much for, for the notification. We are actually behind time, ladies and gentlemen, so we will be cutting off some of the items on the program. We are now moving forward to the student voices on the uh, ASAT uh, postgraduate studies. Uh, Ms. Ardendorf will take us through this session. Ms. Ardendorf is a deputy director for teaching and learning development capacity improvement program in the Department of Higher Education and Training. She is the project manager for the Early Childhood Care and Education Project. Over to you, uh, Zolda. 
Thank you, Morgan. And good morning, colleagues. A special welcome to the students slash academics who have agreed to join us. I know we have very little time, so I'm just going to jump right in and quickly give a little bit of background um, about each of these students. We have Mr. Dan Sepokhole and Lyndall Potier. Dan is from the Trana University of Technology at the Soshanguve campus. Um, they have both been appointed since 2017 and 2018 respectively on the PEP project and have been assisting with the development of some of the CET programs there. They are both students. Um, Lyndall is engaged in her PhD. Dan has finished his MA as part of the project and he is now to register for his PhD. So I'm going to pose, I'm try, I'll try to fit in two questions um, to each of you um, and in turn. So let's jump right in. Um, Linda, the first question to you. You are doing a PhD with a focus on CET and you brought your interest in social change and social justice to bear on this. Could you share with us what made you choose this specialization and this research topic specifically? Lindo. Uh, good morning. Thank you um, for having me, and thank you for good the question. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. So my move into this uh, research project is an outcome of work that I was involved in before coming back to uh, complete or to pursue my studies. I chose the specialization because my working life in my working life I've been working and volunteering in different uh, developmental and social justice um, spaces and in all of the these adult and community education was was involved was um, part part of that work so then while studying um, and studying towards my master's I was actually exposed to critical pedagogy through um, very importantly at the time the work of Paula Freer which started making me rethink um, the role of education in society and also rethink the community development work that I was doing. Um, while I was working, I also learned about community colleges and these spaces seemed like an answer to some of the challenges that we were facing in the work that we were doing in that they offered a dedicated public learning space for us to do workshops, dialogues, short courses, um, and we could engage, well, we should have been able to engage in these spaces in a range on a range of topics. So gender-based violence or issues related to equitable schooling, violence and crime. So I think for me, this idea of a dedicated institution that could sub provide support to learning related to transformation and social justice um, was exciting. So that's why I, I was interested in these spaces and what they could afford society. Thank you, Lyndall. Um, can you tell us, how do you see your research adding value to your work as a lecturer? Okay, so my work is specifically looking at institutional social justice oriented practice, and I'm interested in mm -hmm. what type of support is needed to um, transform, but also um, sustain work that is non-formal and community driven. And because I'm trying to understand um, pedagogy, curriculum and institutional culture, um, I'm hoping that mm -hmm. that will inform my understanding of these spaces and that I can share that with colleagues and have discussions about how we can rethink curricula in, in terms of what we're hoping these spaces can, can become. Just, yeah. Thank you. That sounds amazing. And good luck with your studies. We hope to see some papers in future. Daniel, over to you. Um, you've completed your M.Ed. in Agricultural Management. and You're now in the process of embarking on a PhD. I know that your interest is in agricultural technology specifically. Can you tell us what made you choose this specific focus and, um, for your, and your research topic? Okay, ma'am. Uh, first of all, the title of my MED study was all about uh, challenges agricultural programs in the selected uh, Tibet colleges. Now, in an attempt to answering my main research question, which was what are the challenges experienced by the lecturers when uh, entering agricultural programs, 
discovered that uh, there was a number of gaps which still need to be closed before we can reach to a level of effectiveness in the uh, asset or in the Tibet colleges with regard to the teaching and learning. And among those gaps, I chose to conduct a, you know, a research in technologies approach towards uh, teaching and learning agriculture programs in the Tibet uh, colleges. Now, in my master's program, I realized that now lecturers had challenges uh, in implementing agriculture uh, technologies approach, uh, you know, to teaching and uh, agricultural programs. And that, that motivated me to want to conduct a research on the title that I've just mentioned, uh, that I've just mentioned uh, uh, under my PhD uh, proposal. Now, the main aim was to, to come up with a model that could help architectural lectures as they try to implement general uh, technologies approaches. Okay. Daniel, so, I, I think we are running out of time, but um, thank you for sharing that okay. and your interest in agricultural technologies and empowering learner, um, lecturers to understand the practical application as well as um, the theoretical knowledge I know lies very close to your heart from discussions with you previously. And uh, could you just add quickly, how do you see this being transferred to the CET space? You know, the terms of a uh, TVET uh, uh, programs uh, have been administered, looking at how the, you know, teaching the lecturers. I would realize that TVET uh, as well as the asset programs are the same thing. You know, if ever you empower the lecturer who's going to teach in the TVET, it will be the same as uh, empowering the same lecturer who can also teach in the CET because they will offer the same skills to the same candidates, particularly referring to agriculture as I was talking about it. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Lyndall. And there were further questions, and I know you had a lot to share about your experiences of being both postgraduate students as well as academics. We wish you the best of luck with completing your studies. And um, I don't envy you having to juggle both. I've been in that position. But so thank you so much again for joining us. I'm going to hand over now because Michelle will probably need to close. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zelda, Daniel, and, and Lyndall. I appreciate the fact that your time was shortened. I'm not going to um, waste any time. I am supposed to be giving a couple of closing statements. So I'm going to just try to sum it up in the two minutes that we have left. Um, I think the uh, Salim spoke about Neville Alexander's um, Proverbs verse that without a vision, uh, the people uh, no longer... Um, uh, the people perish. So the vision of the DHIT is to have a transform system which will enrich the economic, social and cultural lives of our people, will promote social justice and overcome historical inequities. However, if we view that vision within that triad of poverty, unemployment and inequality, we can see that it is very complicated and not as easy as uh, the vision itself states. There are challenges that that um, have arisen in this uh, um, webinar, challenges around the impact of historical inequalities that derail any activities that we implement to achieve our vision, around policies that might seem ideal but in reality cannot be implemented, around pedagogical choices not being appropriate for the context of um, adults and community education and training, around human capital theories, which are not, um, which are dissonant, which are alienated from what we would want in terms of using transformative pedagogies, et cetera, and about the political economy lens that um, it is perceived uh, that the department has to work through. I have to say that um, our strategies 
have been well received in the webinar in terms of the project that has been undertaken, that our participants are well aware of the challenges that they have faced, that there have been innovative activities that have been undertaken, for example, with the CET uh, lecturers in terms of the um, the access to data, et cetera, during COVID, that there is a global learning platform for adult um, education, but also that in South Africa, we have DVV who's working on, I think it's called the Moja for Africa platform for adults and community education and training. Um, and we have partnerships within our country that we need to really leverage off and work hard in terms of strengthening those partnerships. Um, I, I think that having said that, um, we cannot be accused of not trying our very best to achieve the vision of the country. Not, um, not going saying the fact that there will be challenges and that is why we encourage research, interrogation and critique to assist us in together as a community of practice and in terms of our collaboration in the sectors to try to make things work. I think it was Salim who said once that Africa, despite the shortcomings and the good and the bad times, will eventually survive. And I'm certain that in the adult community education and training sector, that it will be a hard, long slog, but together we can try to achieve the goals of 2030. 2030. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. Apologies to Sandra and Selma, who took so much time to prepare, but I promise that we will make another space for you to utilize that presentation. Um, time just ran away. And the Mail and Guardian, I want to say thank you so much for always hosting so well. It's a pity that it's just four hours, but um, it also is a privilege for us to be able to use your platform and we appreciate the fact that you do not charge the department for for this particular um, support that you are giving to us. I am going to read from Salma saying that um, uh, it would have been a short presentation for her and Sandra, uh, but she is very um, concerned about being disappointed without any warning and um, I know you participated in the two dry runs and I see that we're moving on to one minute after four hours but I cannot guarantee that you won't be cut off in the next few seconds. I'm really sorry about that. Please accept our apologies but we will try to follow up with you. Um, thank you so much for your dedication and your commitment to participating in the webinar. Thank you, everyone, for the participation. Take care, God bless, and keep safe.